All right, gentlemen, we will go ahead and get started. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, we do appreciate it. We've got, um, I think, some interesting information to share with you and hopefully some good discussion. Thank you for everybody out there being flexible with our seating. Uh, we are in the midst of our Leadership Academy for this week. So uh, those kids have been here um, every day and they, and they use these tables. And so rather than convert the whole room when those kids left at four o'clock, we figured um, these tables would work out. Now there's a table in the back of the room I'm a little worried about. This as a former junior high principal, they look like it could be a chatty bunch back there, but we'll, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll see how that goes. I think they'll be all right. But we'll, uh, <clears throat> tonight we're really uh, want to share with you the information about House Bill 3 and the ramifications of that for our district. And um, that's going to be a very fluid conversation, and we'll talk a little more about that. And we'll talk about exactly how that affects our budget for 1920 and then look ahead a little bit to 2021. And then um, Easy and I will we'll talk a little bit about um, the Conroe High School project that was in the uh, May bond and potential options for that moving forward and looking ahead. So we'll we'll talk briefly about that, but the majority of our conversation tonight will be House Bill 3 and the preliminary budget overview. And Darren's going to share the House Bill 3 information and Chris will jump in where it affects us academically. But um, we talked about the fluidity of this process. We are still receiving information from the state um, daily and it changes our outlook. And a perfect example of that is Darren received a phone call this afternoon that was a $7 million phone call the wrong way. So from one of the, the, the folks that provide us with our spreadsheets that basically give us the estimates of what our funding will be, they called this afternoon at 4 o'clock, yeah, about 3.30, and said, oh, we had a mistake in our calculations. And that mistake, it was a $7 million mistake on our bottom line. So um, we've gone in and already adjusted some things that we might recommend tonight based on that information. But just so you know that it is that fluid at this point there's just nothing concrete so um some of the things that we share or talk about tonight we might in two weeks from now be saying hang on it it looks different today so um but we'll we'll share with you what we know today so i'm going to turn it over to darren once again what i would encourage and we, we use this setup intentionally to promote conversation so please if you have questions or or any comments along the way we just encourage you to jump in um, and, and help us out. So, Mr. Rice, you want to start us off? Sure. Well, good evening, President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Ball. It is my pleasure uh, to present the 2019-2020 preliminary budget. <coughs> We're going to start uh, with a look at the legislative update on House Bill uh, you know, 3. And as Dr. Null said, you know, things are beginning to get clear on House Bill 3 each day. However, we're still waiting on numerous rulings and and clarifications on the bill, you know, just like today, as Dr. Noel said, 3.30, we got a call when there was a change in our funding amount. So this presentation is going to be based off the information that we know today as of right now, and it is subject to change, and there will be changes. But, uh, you know, we'll move forward with this. Uh, just a brief summary of the bill as it stands. It, it, it contained $5 billion with the property tax relief. Uh, four and a half billion dollars just in general public education, uh, two billion dollars uh, for increase in teacher pay, and uh, requires the implementation of a full day pre K program. So, now just uh, looking at our basic allotment, the basic allotment will increase from $5,140 per ADA to $6,160 per ADA. And this is the basic mechanism that the state is using to pay for the tax compression and the employee raises. And looking at uh, full day pre-kindergarten pre that we just talked about, it requires districts to provide full day pre-K to eligible four-year-old students. Uh, the district may seek, seek a waiver. We do, we're able to do two three-year waivers uh, on this program. Partial funding for this is provided by the new early education allotment, and we'll talk about that in a second. And I've asked uh, Dr. Hines just to talk about some of the costs we have cons considering full, full day K. I think it might be helpful if we just put in a little bit of information about pre-K just to kind of start thinking about. Uh, for the 1920 year, for example, we're projecting 1,468 pre-K students. Those students in our current model are served in two half-day sessions. Um, 
And so we, we, have re we have reason to believe that going to a full day program that we would serve more than that um, because we, we, have, we have in the past seen, I think last year, about 850 of our kindergartners would have been eligible for pre-K but didn't come for one reason or another. So we, we do think that there's probably going to be an increase once we go to all day. Um, we currently serve pre-K on 25 different campuses, 11 of which do not have gyms. And I only point that out because um, as we add teachers and we add more students to rotations, we have to think about where does the conference period fall? Uh, so currently our pre-K teachers get their conference period during the break between the two sessions. And so um, if we have students there all day, we're going to have to have a, a solution for rotating and a place for them to go so they can have their, their conference period. So those are all things that we have to start thinking about. Uh, we currently have 49.5 allocations, 29.5 of those are for regular ed, 20 are for bilingual education. Uh, that's roughly about 3.25 million in payroll. Um, that number again would likely go up and generally just even with growth that might go up one or two when the year starts. Um, we have estimated the cost to outfit a classroom when you think about furniture for the small ones or the technology or instructional materials um, at about $22,000 a classroom. Uh, this also impacts special education so I wanted to make a note of that. We currently have 19 PPCD allocations so um, we, we, cert we provide special education services to four-year-olds as well, and they may get it through PPCD, in which they do some, uh, where we integrate students into mainstream into regular class with support, and some are pullouts. Um, and so we estimate, just when we I modeled this, that uh, going to full day, we would just reasonably double that number, similar to the pre-K uh, numbers of teachers. Um, and again, that would require us uh, to to outfit those rooms. So if you think about it, that's uh, doubling the number of classrooms. So that's about 65 to 70 classrooms that we have to come up with to implement that. Yes, Mr. Husband. Question. Do you know what percentage of our current pre kers that go for a half a day ride the bus? We are working on a bus plan. I'm going to turn around and Mr. Kager's looking at it. Yeah. Um, Right now we have uh, roughly 400 in the a.m. and uh, 500 in the p.m., which uh, is about 60, 70 percent. Thank you. So it would be 900 if they had to go all day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah it would essentially be doubling the number getting on the bus in the morning and doubling the number getting right. off in the afternoon. And, and that's why that last bullet <clears throat> that I added, what we haven't determined yet, and we're still trying to... Well, plus your growth. Plus growth. Yeah, I mean, that's just, that's the percentage of the ones that are already that are here. current, yes, sir. Plus it will be growth. But we're just trying to, there's some other things that we're still studying and looking at. Uh, the transportation impact is one of those. And certainly in some cases, there's room on a bus for some additional students, but in other cases, it will trigger a new route, a new bus. Um, we're also looking at other services that might be impacted. Um, an example of that might be we, we have more students going to the clinic. We might have a school that has a half-time clinic aid. might have to make that a full-time clinic aid, those kinds of things. Um, and then the lunch impact, our ability to serve lunches, which is where not having a gym comes in because we have to add another lunch. But currently we are serving lunch as an option to our pre-K students, so that's less of an impact. Uh, we make it available before they leave and when they arrive. Uh, and then uh, the other one, as I mentioned, is the elective impact, the ability to have a specials for them to rotate in. We're having to look at that. What does that mean? Will that, will that require an additional teacher on the staff or not? And that's going to vary from campus to campus. But those are some of the things we're looking at um, and things that we're thinking about in terms of pre-K. And there's probably a lot of things we haven't thought about yet, but we, we started that process of trying to, and there's a, we have to develop a curriculum for the whole day program. You know, it'll be another thing that will cost. We'll have to develop that. Um, that's generally uh, something we're used to doing and know how to do. Dr. Hines? Yes, sir. I think the wording on the previous slide said for eligible students, did this bill change the eligibility for pre-K no. at all? Didn't, so. yeah. well, wasn't there something there about teacher students might be eligible? Or and and te all, any teacher student is eligible for the pre-K. So that might increase. That'll definitely bring our numbers. That'll, that'll, that'll bring an increase as well. And how many of our current Pre-K teachers are half-time and only teach for half of the day and then swap out. 
Very few. Okay. Three, three or four. Three, three or four. Okay. Yeah, it's very few. Still... Dr. Hines, I got a couple of questions for you. Mine are going to be fairly basic, but why is the state of Texas wanting to do this? What what rationale are they giving to say that school districts need to offer full day pre K? <laughs> and I'm and some people may jump in and feel free. I'm gonna I'm gonna start with it and um, Dr. Upshaw is here and Dr. Phillips and Dr. Winkler may have some things they want to add, but I'll start with first. There's been several studies released that, that have really shown um, the impact that early education has on students, uh, particularly students that are acquiring English or um, and, and maybe um, less off economically. So there, there is in, there is there's research that supports those students getting off to a, a, a full start, a head start. Um, and really working on the literacy, the early, you know, the early sounds. The, it's really about learning readiness. So we know a really strong year in pre-K can set the stage for a really good year in kindergarten, which sets the stage for a really good year in first grade. And one thing that we've tracked over the years, and, and I think the research supports this, is the acquiring of those abilities early makes a difference. Because uh, once gaps grow, it's very difficult for students to close those gaps. And so it, it really is about trying to target students for accelerated uh, learning readiness and really pre-K and I'm not an expert in it I am not an early childhood person but, but I really believe it has a lot to do with you know introducing sounds and, and learning the things that are age appropriate you know of, of words and, and colors and just being exposed to things. One of the things that we also look at for our, our students we do prepare them academically but we also prepare them for the social environment. So there's a big piece of now with technology and integration we have to spend some time showing kids how to do school. So we do a lot of that social emotional sharing, you know, playing together, how you're a good collaborative citizen within the classroom. That's a lot of those pre-K guidelines. So yes, it's going to give them academic readiness, especially in the areas of literacy, like Dr. Hines saying. But it's that whole social emotional environment that is a huge part of what we do. And so we want that for kids so that they are ready. Because kindergarten and first grade is not what we did. It's a lot more rigorous. We need kids reading, coming out of kindergarten reading level. That is the expectation. So it helps fill both those areas. Okay. Alex, okay. Yeah. Anything else on that? Yeah. And I think eligibility has to do more with about access. Just access, those children that don't have access to early interventions or early opportunities for education. Or but going from a half day to full day, what more are they going to be picking up on a full day? At, and we're talking about four year olds, right? Four-year-olds, we're talking about four-year-olds. Pre-K, uh, You know, and a couple of things I'll mention. One is uh, certainly there's a, probably a certain number of students that we do not serve because parents need a whole day solution for daycare. Um, and so <clears throat> that's a reality. Uh, but I, I do think that's one of the things that that is part of that planning is that there, there are identified programs that do a pretty good job of this and balance those things uh, that, that those early early age students would benefit from that's age appropriate and, and uh, at that at that time too there's going to be wide differences in what children come into the classroom able to do so um, you know I think it's about more time it's about uh, more interaction um, it's also about you know being uh, introduced to concepts in a systematic way and, and, and having a way to enter to move students forward, so I, I, I don't know enough about what our you know what a full day is going to look like. I think that's part of the challenge. I think is really yeah. drawing that up. What does it look like? When we when we went from half day kindergarten to full day kindergarten in our district, the curriculum expectations didn't change. But as a district, we were able to expand the curriculum. For example, we were lucky in half day kinder to get kids to be able to write a sentence that they recognized in a big book that they read, like I see the cat blue or whatever. Uh, we had kids writing a page, you know, because we went to full day. And then our reading expectation, we were able to extend that in our district. So kids would come out back then reading on a level three, we were able to put it to a level four. Because we, and nothing changed in the curriculum expectations at the time, but we were able to, to get more kids on level because we had more time. More time. So could you talk a little bit more about the uh, three-year waiver? What, what would that look like? It's two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three, three years. years. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think for us, realistically, <clears throat> we would have to do the first waiver. Um, we need some time to implement 
Um, and only because we're talking about needing 70 classrooms, which we, it's there's there's probably we probably identified some schools that we could do it this year, and we're looking at maybe trying to do a pilot at one or two, just to to start learning more about what we can and can't do. Um, but it is it's one that we won't be able to implement fully overnight because of all these reasons. We have to kind of a understand what we're getting into. Um, Having the double number of four-year-olds, and this is a small thing, at the end of the day to keep up with, to make sure they get on the right bus going home, mm -hmm. is a challenge, right? And we don't want to just do that without thinking about uh, how we move kids around, what they're doing. Uh, so it is a, it's, it's a very small age, and it's one that we wouldn't take lightly. We want to do a lot of planning and understand right. what, but, but I think the three-year waiver to get fully implemented is not unreasonable. Qualifications. What was the? What are the qualifications for uh, full day pre care once implemented? Same as we have now. Same as we have now. Which um, is what? Which is socioeconomic. Socioeconomic uh, need. English, uh, language, uh, English language, language learner. Um, military. 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 military um, and teachers. Foster child. Right. Homeless. Um, and, and now a teacher's, teacher's child. child. It sounds like the Texas Star Awards. Mr. Mm -hmm. Parent has um, the Texas Star Award for yep. being adopted. So there's some other qualifications. Dr. Hines, can you circle back to the, you said the need of 70 classroom need. How was that, how will that impact us and how, was that addressed in the previous demographic study, so, the previous bond plan, yeah, any of that? Yeah, the, 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 <laughs> great, great question. So when we, when we were doing all our planning on the last bond, we did not plan for implementing an all day pre-K and, and that needs to be understood up front. So this is um, a, certainly a big enough initiative that we have to take notice and plan for. That's roughly another campus. Yeah, that, that we, we didn't allow. Has, that, was, that was just dropped in our lap. Have we done any studies or had time to do any studies about the possibility of a district-wide early childhood campus and putting all full-day pre-K in one building? Certainly we're looking at that as well. I think that's, at the end of the day, a combination of, of where it makes sense, where we can get some high density. It's it, it certainly, there's advantages. Uh, it's a common practice in other districts to have uh, you know, pre-K center, there's a high, you know, what's the area do? of those districts? I mean, our district is so bad. Yeah, we couldn't do it. We couldn't do it, we we couldn't do do it district wide. No we, yeah. we wouldn't do it district wide. We might be able to pull it off in some of our more dense areas, but, but we couldn't do it district wide. I think that's, we understand that, but we are looking at that question and whether that's something that might be a solution or a way for us to, to, to do this. But th that has implications we have to work through. You know, what sure. does that do to transportation? Because we'd be creating a whole nother school route. To, to route for it. Well, I don't want to sound like I'm, I know we need to move on. I don't want to sound like I'm you know, not trying to educate the kids, but has there, has there been any pushback from other districts about, about this that you're aware of? Or what's the overall tone of... I don't of, think they asked permission. Yeah, yeah it, was, it, was, it wasn't <laughs> right. really a conversation. It was yeah. a, here's what we're going to do. That's, yeah, that's yeah. But I, I, I hear you. Yeah. Well, one last question. For you. Go ahead, Mr. Kidd. Oh, is uh, based on just who y'all connect with, is it anticipated that almost all districts across the state will exercise the waiver? In other words, will we have plenty of districts to kind of gather ideas, gather, kind of see how they do it before we jump in, or is it? I, I without knowing, I'm, my guess would be is I think you're going to see all of the above. Uh, so there are very small districts that, that doing this is just flipping a switch. There's some places that already do this. Um, so, you know, they're not going to change anything. I think for some districts, if you've got some space and it's a small program, adding another classroom is not a big deal. Uh, I think there will be districts that are larger, that are fast growing, that are space challenged like we are, that, that may have to slow it down and manage it a little closer. So I, I think, personally, I think there'll be some of all the above, but I think we'll fall into that category of we we'll, we plan to execute and we'll, we'll plan to put it in place. We just we just have to manage that process. And much like we've done many other things, I think you'd see a pilot for a couple of campuses, then you may see a, another pilot for a feeder zone, and then you see it go district-wide. So it'd be a step-by-step -step implementation. Um, but you think about our 
feeder zones that would be most impacted based on qualifications, Conroe and Caney Creek, both of those are feeder zones that were in the last bond package, we had a new elementary in each of those feeder zones. And then now immediately we will be filling um, the current elementaries beyond capacity as well. So it's just a consideration we'll have to look at for future uh, in the future as well. It's just, we lost a lot of capacity overnight in our elementaries um, with that. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Rice. Okay, this is, this is one of the areas that we're going to be looking for some guidance from the board and talking about teacher compensation. And in House Bill uh, 3, it requires districts to use 30% of the revenue gain. Now, this is one of the areas that we're waiting for further clarification on, but based on uh, our understanding of the law, you'll see our presentation uh, of, of what that is. But we must use that 30% of revenue gain for compensation increases for full-time employees other than administrators. Of this amount, 75% must be used for full-time teachers, counselors, nurses, and librarians. Prioritize, prioritizing differentiated compensation for classroom teachers with more than five years of experience. The remaining 25% of the gain may be used for increased compensation paid to full-time district employees, except for uh, administrators. So how will this look? Uh, based on our calculation, the minimum requirement uh, that we're coming up with is our, F, our, our FSP increase is $33.6 million, and 30% of that is $10,080,000. So for a bare minimum, the raise for teachers, counselors, librarians, and nurses is $7,560,000. Uh, for the remaining full-time employees, that leaves $2,520,000. Uh, so with that, we've made y'all some options to choose from. And just kind of give us some direction what you're looking at. We have various scenarios with this. Uh, scenario one matches the minimum requirements that we're required to do based on House Bill 3. Um, so we can do any combination of these. We can move numbers around, but this is me just trying to give y'all some choices of what it might look like. So looking at uh, scenario one, that, that's a 3.5% raise for teachers, librarians, and nurses. Um, that cost $8.4 million. That would be a $2,025 raise for our teachers. Uh, all other uh, full-time employees other than administrators is a 3% raise at a cost of $2.4 million. Administrators, a 2.5% raise, $1.6 million. That's a total cost of $12.4 million. Mr. Rice? Yes, sir. On those categories, yes. um, where are you putting people like LSSPs, where are you putting speech language pathologists? Are they following under counseling services, under all others? That's, that's what about instructional <laughs> coaches, certified RTI specialists, people like that? That's a great debate. Um, we have <laughs> we engaged, we, we we engaged in uh, vigorously today. this morning. Um, I think on the campus level, it's, it, it's, fairly, it's fairly easy to identify people that are in teaching positions as far as um, instructional coaches or things based on the campus level where it gets a little more confusing is when you get into our um, our AE pay plans and you start to see the, the categories like LSSPs and DIAGs. I think that's that's a debate that we haven't really been able to finalize yet. Is, is, you know, do they do they count under the everybody else in the plan as administrators or do they fall under the the teacher category. I was just wondering one. if y'all have put them in one of now, these categories <clears throat> for these calculations. For these calculations, the well, campus-based people we, would be in the top line. Yeah, yeah we've that, more than covered yeah. okay. what, what that cost would be yeah. for them. Okay. In, 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 We're talk, it is a, you're just, you're just <laughs> debating right now, or your question is yeah. which one of the tranches they fall in. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And part of that is, is going back to, okay. to, to determine um, <clears throat> we need to see where the salaries would fall. And the same thing can happen you know, you, if you go... <clears throat> 5% for teachers and an assistant principal was to get 2.5%, it's very likely we could have teachers making a higher daily rate than, than an assistant principal could be. And it's the same situation for a district level instructional coach or, or an LSSP. We wouldn't want someone to take a pay cut mm -hmm. to move into one of those positions. So we, we need to evaluate that moving forward. This this chart, you know, Darren, to Darren's credit and his team, Karen and everybody, um, you know, we had one chart ready, and then we had a $7 million phone call at 4 o'clock, and now we have a new chart here for you. Right. So thank you, Karen, for making that happen in a short amount of time. 
Um, so, by way of clarification, yes, the see how I ask the last three years, what has been our average increase for like teachers? Okay. Two and in, in the neighborhood three percent. Okay, so these scenarios that you're giving us, those, in other words, that's that's just like the first one would only be a. 0.5% increase over what we've usually done. Correct. Okay. So even, so getting an influx of money that people know are for salaries, I'm just trying to gauge. Part of the challenge is that when House Bill 3 was communicated from uh, our leadership, they, they, they've they put out there that teachers are going to receive a $4,000 raise. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not how this was funded. Um, you know, when they when they say an average of four thousand dollar raise, they're including the amount of money that's going into TRS as part of that, and the amount of money that's going into um, uh, the potential for earnings in the future for summer programs. But the sound bite out there was that teachers were going to get a four thousand dollar raise, and so we are taking that into account of what and, and, and the what other they've thing heard. The is, is the, the salary discrepancy is from yeah. one end of the spectrum to yeah. the other. Yes. The minimum is still what? 20. Oh, it's well below. Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's like going up 4,000 or something. Yeah, but it's like 28,000, yeah. so yeah. now it's 32. Right. Well, I mean, our starting sure. teachers are 50 plus. Yeah. 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 So yeah. It's, it's a, it, there's a very, um, you know, yeah. positive or negative. I'm just saying it's, there's a big spectrum out there that they were trying to fix with one set plan. Yeah. The, the, where we, the, the actual verbiage, you know, that, that the legislature said it was a, like, like Dr. Noel said, it was a $4,000 compensation package go. by mm -hmm. average. So uh, $1,000 off the top goes to TRS so that, so that that percentage doesn't have to come out of their pay to state paying that directly. So then it's a actual, on average across the state, a $3,000 uh, actual salary mm -hmm. increase if you take that off the top. And so, so a couple of questions. Could you, could you go back one slide, please? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so my my question is, is, is this the money, well, i got a couple. Is this to be implemented for the 2019-2020? Yes, sir. Okay, so we've got that much time to, to talk about it. We have till August. Yeah. We've got to have a but, budget. But, 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 but for us, you, you know, yeah. you know yeah. But, but, but we need to. I understand. Yeah. So this is, this is money that is coming from the state. This is not this is not our part of our budget already. This is money that's coming to the state. My my question is, what in the scenario? What if we as a board choose not to do pay raises at all? Would we still we're, need to we're, implement? We're this required plan? by law to do at a minimum uh, this amount. that first company, that first, first that first scenario. The only ones that are excluded from that is administrators. The other. The other uh, because of this, because of, if yeah. this wasn't, if we didn't have this money coming in at all, would we still be required to give teachers a pay raise every single year? No. no. Okay, I want to make yeah. sure that I'm clear on but, that. But first of all, this is a question: When you went from five to six, whatever the actual numbers are, ADA, okay, uh -huh. that include that. The difference is the state money. The other is still the pass through, right? On the, I mean, from prop, from other property well, tax. We'll, we'll I mean, one, part yeah, of one, the one, part of the six is still the property tax. Yeah, yeah. One, it's not all from the state. Yeah. yeah. One one thing we're going to see, Mr. Husbands, is a move to current year values. So we're not going to have the one year lag anymore. So as our property values go up in that same year, our state funding is going to go down that same amount. So we're not going to have the luxury um, of riding the float but, each year. So that's all I'm gone. all I'm simply saying is he said, you know, that, that this money is is new. It's only. The only the thousand dollars ADA, you know, per student yes. is new money. The other has always been there. It's just they that's to replace the compression, right? Yes. Okay. And it's really okay. to dovetail you. what Ski was saying as far as years to come. It's really more of a <clears throat> mechanism from a teacher's salary standpoint to just kind of raise the bar a little bit to, to and, kind of and set the base. Yeah, and, and and what the what the law actually does is set is set the standard for any time the basic allotment increases, we'll be required to calculate this and we will be required to give raises based on this calculation moving forward. 
So in the next biennium, if the, if the uh, basic allotment increases anymore, we'll have to, you know, we're, we're mandated to do those. Unless raises. they change the law. Unless they change the law. Right. Yes, sir. Mr. Edmund, I saw you had a question. Yeah, just so I'm sure as well, and uh, Mr. Husbands and uh, Mr. Huber brought this, may have this question. It was 5140 is what the state's giving us per student? Yes. And now they're going to 6160? Mm -hmm. So 1,020 difference, that's per student. So we have 64 students, 64,000. Times 1,020, 65 million, 280. That's the new money coming in, 65 that, million? Well, there's there's also, that is just on that on that piece, but but I'll show you in the in a further slide how that actually nets out because we're also losing, this is the first oh, year since 2005, we're losing tax revenue because the tax tax rate's being compressed. Our net increase um, that, that we're looking at is the $33,600,000. When you look at how the, the, the whole funding formula works, <coughs> That's just on the basic allotment that you're talking about. There's so much more in, okay. in, into so the funding into formula. Because yes. that, that, my numbers are completely different yeah, than yeah. these. So I, I, yeah, 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 we'll I'm missing to a it. piece you're going to get to. I'll yeah. Be yeah. yeah, I mean, the funding formula is Well, yeah, you got to take into the compression and the other uh, allotments. Are yeah, all the, all the other allotments because, are going away. So. Yeah, because there's stuff that's, that, that is actually okay. being repealed. And so we'll, we'll talk about some of those. So Mr. Rice, I have a question. Yes, sir. For $10,080,000. Yes, sir. That's money that's coming that's the difference that you've kind of estimated that can be used for salary increases. Yes, sir. Is that right? Yes, sir. So if you go back to the scenarios, it has to be. It has to be. It has, yeah. has, 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 to, be. Yeah. It has to be at a minimum, right? I understand. Yeah. 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 I understand. Yeah. But when you look at the scenarios, they're yeah. all in excess of that amount. Yeah. Well, because administrators, you see the line for administrators. Right. Um, that's not included and has to be. That's what I'm saying. Administrators, we're not required to give administrators a raise. I understand. So I understand. so that is our recommendation. And then to get to round numbers like 3.5%, uh -huh. um, that's a little bit higher than what we have to, to give. But, right. I mean, it, it could be 3.275%, you know, to make it balance perfectly. So so I just rounded up to 3.5%. <laughs> Because we, we normally give 3, 3.5%. Okay, so my seven. question then is if we've got 10 million, eight, 80,000, mm -hmm. and we're already above that, where's that coming from? Well, they, I mean, only seven, you know, the 10, the 10 million 80 is 75% of the $30 million increase. So it's, it's the, you know, it's coming out of that additional $20 million that so you'll see that out we have coming out of that Yes, okay. yes, sir. So even in scenario five, which is $20 million, mm -hmm. above, that would leave us 10 million. If Correct. We were to so choose scenario five. Correct. Okay. So that's what I wanted to understand. Darren, what is a and, and we're gonna get to and see the, the total budget, but what is a number that you feel comfortable the bottom line number that you would feel comfortable with with leaving the, yeah, the before, proper amount of money in yeah, the budget? But, you know, you know, before we got the phone call at three thirty mm -hmm. today, we were looking at scenario four. Fit fit very well in our budget, but we had to back down to and we created uh you know, working with Dr. Noll, we created scenario three, and I feel very comfortable with uh, uh, that scenario as far as fitting into our budget. That will leave us, um, you know, some money left over at the end of the year for the budget because the real the real questions that we're going to face are in 2021 as we face uh, number, additional tax compression, the cost of education index is going away, and um, there's a let me, let me pull that so moving to current year property values right. that's going to affect us greatly but we won't feel that until next year right. and so we need to be prepared as we have in the past sure you know it's a two-year biennium so we need to make sure we have funds to carry cover both years right. by right. and it's as darren said this is we can work off of this so if you know if you all feel more comfortable with four three and two and a half or four, three and a half and two and a half, whatever, those are all, we can mix and match here to get in a package. But um, as Darren mentioned, I think scenario three is the max of where we would want to be um, or, or two. I mean, that number is, is close there as well. I know, I know the compression is over two years and, you know, but as always, you know, sometimes they come up with these, I'm, I'm going to call it a mandate for a minute. I mean, it's a good thing, but you know, 
they give you the money for it this two years. Right. That's correct. But that's a permanent salary increase. How about those next two years when we got a different set up there? Right. Okay. That's the part yes. that John, scares everybody. Oh, I think, John, you hit on something. You, know, <laughs> you better be watching better, better than just the that. next two. Right. You yeah. Know. Agree that's the scary mean, that part. Because really cool. you know they have a bad year, and the rainy day fund's not rainy day anymore. Mm -hmm. Hello. And and, yeah. I, and I'll I'll be straight with y'all. We don't have very good information for 2021. That's even more so. We mm -hmm. we don't have uh, you know a lot of strong information so that I can I can actually show y'all maybe a, you know a pro forma for 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 you know the next year. We just don't have the information because it's still coming out for for next for the 1920 school year. So. Man, as you mentioned so. before, I mean, you kind of hit the nail on the head for me. Since I've been on the board, we've given about a two and a half or three percent pay increase each year. So I would be leaning more toward the right end of the scale, assuming that wasn't the case. But because we have done very well as it relates to our yearly, the consistency is where raises have been so con and very well, I, in my opinion, I'm leaning more on the left end based on some of the reasons that John laid out in the uncertainty this year. Just can, speaking to. Can, can I ask one more question? Uh -huh. Yes, sir. How did y'all come up in, in your minds? Uh, not not whether we like it or anything else, but how did y'all come up with scenario three? Other than you had to come off the 17 to get back to 14, I, I got all that. But how, how, how did y'all come up with that? You said it fits into the budget, leaving us enough to do. Yeah, when, if, if uh, I don't have a hyperlink, but we'll, we'll go, we'll, can we jump in? Yes. Yeah. Jump in? Well, and the, hey, you can answer this question yeah. whenever you get. Yeah. yeah. Well, let me answer the just the philosophical how how scenario three and how all these were built. And once again, it's always your decision. We just tried to build these based on what you've done historically. And historically, we've you know because of this legislative session, teachers you know are are um, expected to get more. Okay, and we've typically done a, a, a larger raise for our hourly employees than we have for administrators percentage wise. So that's how you see how that one got built. Um, and certainly those numbers can change, but as far as why you see the delineation between the groups, that's why, because that's, that's our history of how we've done it. Um, and certainly even within that, there would still be those targeted positions like we've had in the past, you know, where we, so we may say three and a half for all other positions and TASB may come in and tell us, Hey, your bus drivers need to go up even more and we would target the bus drivers if that's the was the indication so could could we go just without stretching too much but a little bit of stretch could we go scenario three four percent four percent three percent if i do the calculations it's around 14.7 and still be that's kind of that's the same mm -hmm. exactly what i was thinking yeah because mm -hmm. you want to yeah four four and three yeah that's about four hundred thousand more yeah so Maybe if we, Darren, do you want to maybe run through the rest of your your presentation, and then we can circle back to this once we've seen the big picture. Yeah, and then we can let's okay. have a little more discussion on it. Okay. I'm looking at the comp uh, compensatory education allotment. This is a pretty unique. It, cre it creates an index for compensatory education allotment based on census blocks, and the index contains five tiers categorized according to the relative severity of the economically disadvantaged students. So how they're gonna come up with that, we're still waiting on, on, on more information and we'll actually receive uh, you know, what those census blocks are from, from TEA. And those weights will range from uh, 0.225 to 0.275. Uh, what 0.225 of what? Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, okay. The, no. Is it on, on top of the normal ADA? On yes. What what this will do is you'll take 0.225 times that by the basic allotment 6160 times it by the uh, students participating in that program, and that determines how much additional funding so, for that program. So instead of 61, you get 63. Correct. Whatever. Yeah. Whatever it is. Whatever yeah. the math works out to right, be. Right. But it's on top of um, ADA. Correct. It's 0.22 percent. Okay. Yes. Yes. Right. And, and, and you'll see that throughout when we talk about weights, um, you know, how that works. On the bilingual allotment, it establishes a new dual language allotment. Uh, they have a couple of new weights in, in that program also. Uh, that'll generate about $1.5 million uh, worth of revenue. You know, in this program, we'll also have the, the offsetting expenditures that you'll see that uh, 
will increase in there. Uh, the career and technology uh, <coughs> CTE allotment, it extends career and technology all the way to seventh grade. So instead of just ninth through 12, it'll be seventh grade two through uh, 12. Uh, that'll also add about $1.5 million to that program. Uh, the transportation allotment, it replaces uh, the linear, linear density calculation that we currently use with a straight $1 per mile, and that's basically a break even for the district. We drive 7.3 million miles and we'll receive $7.3 million, and in the current calculation, that's just about what we receive uh, with the linear density calculation. So just a wash for the district. New allotments that we're receiving. Uh, the, the dyslexia allotment, once again, it's a weight of 0.01 for the students participating in dyslexia. But just uh, this is one of the areas that we're really growing in in the district. In 2016, 2017, we had 2,342 uh, 2, students that were identified as dyslexic. Uh, this current year, we have 3,244 students. So just in that time, you know, we've seen that number increase. Uh, the dropout recovery school allotment, we're still having to get uh, information on that to see if we'll even qualify for this allotment. So that, that information <coughs> is uh, further to uh, come to us. Uh, fast growth school district allotment, that's a weight of 0.04 for our total ADA. That'll generate, that's generating us uh, 14 million extra dollars. That is really what the state is saying is taking place of moving to current year property values and the cost of education index being repealed. That is their answer. Uh, you know, for for that move. Do you like um, it? Is this still? Are all I do not these, like moving to current year property values. Mm -hmm. Are these in? But the I do like the fast growth. That's. I do like the allotment. Uh, but but moving to current year property values is, is going to we're going to see that change next year. And that's got concerns. Okay. I'm sorry. I mean, are are these allotments in your thirty million? Yes. Okay. I just. Yes, sir. They're already they're estimated all, in. They're, there, they're, right? That's all you. They're can do, make right? up the thirty million. Yes, sir. Um, but then there was also uh, some repealed allotments. Uh, one of those is the gifted and talented allotment. We had $2 million from that allotment that's been repealed. However, we're still required to maintain a GT program and details of that program. The high school allotment was repealed. Uh, that allotment was $4.7 million. Um, and, you know, the high schools really rely on this money. And, and, and we'll be working with uh, Dr. Hines and Mr. Colshin and all the high school principals, uh, you know, to, to look at how that how that program is going to is going to meld into the future because there's several you know there's positions you know in there and, and a lot of funding for those high schools so we'll be we'll be working with them for that uh, we lost a staff allotment and that was uh, an allotment that helped us with our insurance our portion of the insurance uh, over two hundred twenty five dollars that was created uh, way back when but that's about the one point six million dollar change does the loss of the GT allotment or the high school allotment put any of our academies in danger no. Um, then the other funding issues, just like I talked about, uh, you know, moving to the current year property values, we're going to see the, you know, the effect of that and the uh, cost of education index, which was an index that uh, when, they, when it was established was to show that it costs more to educate a student in, you know, our area versus a rural district or something like that. So that was, a, that was a, an adjustment that we got, but, uh, but they, they got rid of that, but they have ordered a study possibly bring that back at a future legislative session. So, so that Mr. Been, Rice, so I have it to me. a question about the current year property values. So mm -hmm. they only certify property values once a year anyway. Mm -hmm. So before we were, what is it, July 31st? Or well, well one, of, one of the... We get the certified well, we, values? Well, we get the certified values July 21st, but then they have to go to the comptroller's office, and then the comptroller is the one who actually... Uh, does a study and verifies those to make right. sure that we're within 95%. So right. most of, a lot of times we wouldn't find out what our values actually were certified by the comptroller uh -huh. until January, February. I see. So it's, it's a long time until we get okay. those certified values. So people are going to be adopting budgets. So is that, is that going to, that process changing? That, that process so will be changing. What once, that, once the county appraisal districts provides us certified values, mm -hmm. then that, that's it. Is that it? No, sir. No. The comptroller will still have to. The comptroller will still have to do that. Mm -hmm. And and we're still waiting so, to see what that's going to look like. Okay, that's what I. That, that was my question. Yeah, we do not know how that's going to be. If the mechanism. You don't there. understand that. That makes a big difference yes, to us. Yes, we're right. growing the the rate we grow. It's a significant difference. Yeah, and that makes just. I don't want to digress, but you said you like the fast growth school district allotment. 
Mm -hmm. So are we categorized as a fast growth current Current, district? Currently we are. That is the top 20, the the top Uh quartile, the top 25% of growing district. Currently we are in that quartile. We could drop out if... So some may argue that we're not a fast growth school district, but and this is not our rankings this is this is, this is yeah the state's going to tell are, us yes so we, we are, are a fast growth school district, school district, school yes. district in no the question. state of texas yes yes in the top 20 percentile 25 percentile. 25 percentile over three year average yeah. mm-hmm. and then you know we'll you know i would think and they'll let us yeah i would think so yes <coughs> we and just to clarify you know we preferred staying at the, the the previous year property values that's what we expressed as sure. our preference it didn't work out we we like the fact that they put the allotment in there that would help us but it's not going to cover everything that was lost <coughs> go ahead so this is another area we're going to look for some direction uh, you know from the board on <coughs> that, that looking at the tax compression and tax relief uh, house bill three provides uniform tax relief for the buy-in in in the first year of the biennium, it's a seven cent compression of the tier one maintenance and operation tax rate. So we'll be moving our, our tax rate in the MO side from a dollar four to 97 cents. Um, but there is one piece of this legislation that we're going to need to get clarification on because it prohibits school districts uh, from increasing the MO tax rates to create a surplus to pay down our debt. So, as you are aware, <coughs> this year we transfer currently. Uh, $10 million from the general fund to the debt service fund to buy down our debt. Um, and, and looking at the spirit of that law, what we're doing, you know, is, is, is against that. So we need to find out if what we're doing is still legal uh, versus what the spirit of the law says. Wasn't there a caveat in there that said if it's part of your strategic plan? I have not seen any cut. I, I have not I seen that. It is on one of. I, I I can't tell you. You know, and I read it off the sheet that mm-hmm. y'all gave us. Yeah. But it, there there was something that unless it was part of your strategic plan, you can't do that or something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. It might not have been this, but yeah. it was mm-hmm. so you know, looking at that, um, you know, if we increase the debt service tax, you know, if if, it, if it's determined that we're no longer able to do the ten million dollar transfer from the general fund to debt service. To make up that ten million dollars, uh, we'll have to increase the debt service tax rate by two and a half cents. Um, now, as we were going around through the you know bond referendum process, and, and and one group that we spoke to in particular, the the Texas Patriots PAC, we had a very very hearty discussion with them about this specific uh, issue right here. And and and, and Mr. Sanders, you, you you might remember, uh, maybe maybe help me remember, but they were. Uh, supportive of an increase of the debt service tax rate if we use this $10 million transfer to move over to the M&O budget to, to, to move some of those maintenance type items out of bonds and pay for that out of the M&O budget. And, and, and that is one of the things that I see as, as a positive for this move is, is to address that. So net net, I mean, no, no one, I, mean, I don't see our constituents looking at one versus the other. Net net, the tax rate would, would decrease. Four and a half cents. Four and a half cents. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, so that's the seven cents you dropped on the M&O side and two and a half you picked up on Yeah, they, they would have four and a half cents. So, I mean, I don't see why that's an issue. Right. Yeah. So my question is... And really, this. in the long term, they would save money because we wouldn't be paying interest. Agreed. Mm-hmm. In Agreed. A, in a, if we did, uh, with debt service increase to 97 and 26 and a half, let's just assume that for a minute. What does 26 and a half do our ability to issue a bond uh, with zero tax increase. Does it increase that amount because of the 26 and a half? Or is it just net the same because it's coming from that side instead of the other side? You understand what I'm asking? Yeah. It should be net about the same. It, it's net about the same. Probably increases just, just slightly, but net about the same. Mm-hmm. Net about okay. the same. Cause, cause, you know why I'm asking. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Okay. It, it, it will give us a little bit, but it's net the same. Okay. But what it will do in this situation is it would free up $10 million annually in our maintenance and operations budget that could be used for projects that would no longer need to be included in a bond. So you think if the life of a bond is five years, roughly that'd be $50 million worth of work that could be done and paid for from cash and not be included in the bond project. And as 
um, you know, Darren and I did look at um, our numbers and we had, you know, we did have some five year and 10 year payoff items in our previous bond. Um, and I think the five year payoff items were $23 million, if I remember right. Yes. And the 10 year items were about that, about the same. So it, it might give that option in a future bond to take any of those items that were considered to be five year or 10 year um, lifespan items out of the bond package. Um, so it not only reduces the overall amount, but it, you know, it, it reduces those items that have a shorter lifespan as a potential. I think that was my understanding mm -hmm. was that uh, from the community, the feedback I got was they didn't want us to finance things that were going to be kind of expended over a five year period, mm -hmm. so to speak. And to be able to set aside funds to pay cash for those rather than having to finance those and pay a finance cost on top of the purchase price is probably a great thing to do. If we set aside those funds and we get in the habit of doing that, then in the future, our bond money typically goes just for those long-term assets that are gonna last us a long time. So it does take away, like you said, the technology, it takes away the, the buses, longer buses. term, yeah, yeah, assets such as even buses and even some other maintenance items that mm -hmm. might last five to seven years, but painting, we could cars. pay, mm -hmm. yeah, if we could pay cash for those and uh, rather than, and, and be able to, to basically set aside that allotment for that purpose, I think that's a great way to budget our, our, uh, our funds. And also, again, the tax rate is still lower. Mm -hmm. Mr. Rest, make sure I'm remembering correctly. Your first column there, current tax rate, mm -hmm. that 22 cents on debt service, that reflects the two penny swap we did. Yes, so that, yes. that middle that column back. is essentially really taking us back to 2018 level for correct. the debt service amount. Correct. Yes. Correct. Okay. Yeah, just to, just to support what we've what you said, and I know Mr. Sanders has been saying this for probably three months now, because I've, I've heard it come up a couple of times, which is an easy thing to, to support. And I know the previous boards have done a diligent job of keeping the tax rate low, and I think that may have been uh, something that had been discussed is, you know, in order to keep the, the tax rate low and save money today, right, all those years past, it made sense to ask for bond money for longer term items. So I'm not sure that it was necessarily wrong the way no. the board has been doing it in the past, but no. that is something that we're learning is we we should probably reassess that and start putting money away. And this, this certainly supports that. I, th I think if you look historically, the previous boards have made their primary focus to have a low, the lowest tax rate possible, mm -hmm. which is very admirable. Um, this plan moving forward, gives two primary focuses. Keep the tax rate as low as possible. It's right. still a primary focus. We would still maintain um, one of the lowest tax rates in the Houston area, but it also puts a, a focus on, you know, uh, reducing the amount of debt and paying cash for more items moving forward. So I think it, it just, you know, brings that up to being a, a, a 1A and 1B <laughs> priorities, um, you know, moving moving forward. This, this might be too much of a question for now, but would that money that was saved to put into what we're talking about, would it have to have its own account? Could it be mingled with, with other funds? We, you know, if, if you remember the proposal I made at, at last month's uh, board workshop was to create a maintenance fund. Right. Right. We we're going to seed it with $10 million. I would say a portion of this money would be the continual uh, influx of money into that, into that fund year after year. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Very good. Thank you, Thank you. Y'all asking for guidance. Are y'all getting guidance? Yeah, uh, yeah. I feel like we've got yeah. what well, we need. I, I have one question. And, you know, one of the few that been around for a while, and so I'm guilty of making it the other way, or, or I part of making it the other way, whether I'm guilty or not. I'm just interested in where our bond council is on this, because not council, our bond, our, our finance guy, yeah. is on, on, on this subject. Uh, you know, uh, uh, all of a sudden, well, yeah, all that makes all the sense in the world. Let's not pay any interest on that. But they're, they're forgetting a few things along the way, like the tax it decreases and so on and so forth. And so I'm just curious what he had to say when the point of a debt service fund so that we don't pay interest for any years on some things, where does it work out? Where does he come from? I mean... Where was he 15 years ago when we started this? 
But why is it now less cool? Yeah. I mean, that's a that's good a question. question. Now, 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 when we started the process, it was it was with Frank Kildebrando. It was with a different FA. That's right. Well, um, um, when we started, you know, he, he was he was leading leading that charge. I understand that. And 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 so, you know, trying to. And I don't. Fiscally speaking and financially speaking, numerically, it's not any more wrong today than than or or right today than it was 15 years ago. It well, still makes the numbers still add up. It's a there is a different sense of I think community feeling towards acquisition of debt. I think is really what's changed. Mathematically, it hasn't changed one way or the other. It's just it's the feeling of the public. We used to take the 10 million and put it towards the debt out of. M and O each each year anyway. Mm -hmm. Now we're just simply going to take the ten and keep it in M and O and apply yeah. it to. And over that. the last ten years, you as a board. I understand have what we're doing, Mr. Sanders, but what I don't understand is why all of a sudden uh, uh, the public can point out to our our council that it's it's better to do it this way than this way. And I don't care who started it; it, it we're all a part of it. I mean, you know, whatever I'm going to say it. I'm just curious, is there really that much, uh, 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 I, I'm not sure I understand, I'm not sure I, I have a grips on what the difference is. Yeah, isn't it really perception? Well, huh? because well, no, I, I, I'm doing, fine doing with perception. Doing this way, you're going to say There's a lot cost. of things being I mean, right. really, really what we're cost. saving here is future interest costs. Right. Yeah. With moving, moving the 10 million, it's, it's interest costs is what mm -hmm. we're saving. And so... And if I, if I could, Mr. President, part of the reality is yeah. over the last 10 years, as a board, you have transferred a hundred million dollars, basically roughly ten million dollars a year, into capital improvements. Mm -hmm. You know, we've you've built an elementary out of cash. You've built additions at the Woodlands High School out of cash. You've built the re most recent addition at Irons out of cash. So, so it's really just that shift <laughs> of, and, and I understand it's the same pot of money, and perhaps it is simply perception, but. That idea of instead of funding those long-term assets out of the cash that we've had, funding those from bond funds and using the cash on hand to do the smaller, more maintenance type items, it is it's the same pot of money and it's moving left to right. Agreed, um, but it it is a perception Agreed. piece, I do believe. And, we also have a higher interest rate environment today than we've had in the past ten years as well. So there could be substantial savings on top of that versus doing it 10 years ago as well. Am I tracking right, though, that I mean, you're just talking roughly five years and uh, what I'm seeing is 10 million. I mean, you're talking about 50 million over five years max to be, I mean, that's best case scenario or? Oh, as far as the, what, what we would transfer? Mm -hmm. I mean, that, I mean, that. Ten million is what our plan per year was to move into the, uh, you know, debt service tax rate. So, um, you know, in, into the debt service to buy down the tax rate. So, so we would just assume that would be ten million into the M and O uh, maintenance fund. Because you always, but need it could, carpet, you know, that, that money is at your discretion. Right, right. But I mean, if we were, you know, yeah. shifting the perception, we're still right. going to come out with the same result. Correct. Result about Correct. fifty. Okay. Yeah. Yes, right. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Hello. I agree. Yeah. I'm sorry. I thought I was missing something. No, no you're there. I mean, if I'm missing something, let me know. No, you, you, you are. I'm calculating. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think we, I think we got. Yep. That's a good Go direction. Keep there. Keep moving here. <clears throat> okay, golden, uh, golden pennies. They they increase the golden pennies from six to eight. We'll still be accessing uh, four of the golden pennies. Uh, nine other pennies will be. Uh, copper recapture really doesn't uh, uh, pertain to the district, and I, and, I, and I think with the change in the recapture that, that we've moved a little bit further from the line on, on becoming, I think, what will be called Chapter 49 now instead of Chapter uh, 41. So we're moving further away from that. So that that's really the legislative update we have now, and and really now we'll we'll start looking at. Mr. Rice, can I ask one yes, question sir. about the gold pennies? Sorry, Me too. Sir. So today we access four, four mm -hmm. out of six. Yes. Okay. So there's gonna they're going from six to eight. To eight. Yes, sir. Yeah. So is it our intention to figure out how we can access another two? Okay. My my understanding, and this is some oh, of the clarification we'll get, is next year, if we have a full vote from the board, we can increase 
or MNO tax rate one, one cent right. without having to do a TRE. Right. Um, if if it's a unanimous vote. Correct. So we do have that one cent option. Other than that, we will have to do a TRE. And, and that's a that's a golden penny in fact. Yes, sir. And a golden penny generates what type of funding compared to a regular penny, Darren? Uh, Twice. Yeah, yeah twice. it matches. The state yeah. funding basically matches. Yeah, in other words, what you if we terms. agree as a board then to raise the M&O rate one cent, then the state's going to match it. Yes. In effect. In effect, yes. Yeah. Okay. So now we'll just move into our, our, our traditional budget presentation, and, and we'll start with a look at the major components that drive our budget. And they begin with our budget objectives, and they are to meet the needs for the 2019-2020 school year. Just a reminder that I don't think I'll need to be reminded, but we're opening <coughs> Suchmill Elementary in the 11th grade at Grand Oaks High School. And we want to provide a competitive compensation plan, and that's kind of driven a little bit by House Bill 3. Um, we also have a high priority on safety and security at our campuses. This year we're planning on adding uh, five prevention control officers in another corporate <coughs> position. Uh, and then as we've discussed, we want to protect the district's operational infrastructure by establishing a district-wide maintenance fund. So just quickly on the general fund balance, uh, we ended 2018 at $138 million in our fund balance, so we're in good, good position with our fund balance. Uh, certified property values, uh, we're estimating them to increase by 5.5%. That's going to generate about $1.97 billion to our certified value, bringing that total to about $37.7 billion. Darren, can you just share real briefly about the mall? Situation. Yeah, I, got, uh, I don't. I don't remember if it was last week or the, or the week before. Uh, got an update from Tammy McRae because we had a large, a rather large refund that we were having to issue uh, in the neighborhood of six hundred twenty-five thousand dollars to uh, Dillard's. Um, apparently, Dillard's over the past two years, it, it, it's actually the whole mall. Oh, Every box store within the mall fought their appraised values. Um, and in, 17, in, in 2017, uh, Dillard's fought their value. They dropped it from a 35% a increase, because if you remember, commercial is not limited in their, in their increase. Dropped it from approximately a 30% increase on their building. Uh, they argued, well, they actually sued us. It got dropped to 15%, but they had somebody within the appraisal district who, for their 2018 tax values, bumped it back up a 36% increase. Whew. That person's no longer with the appraisal district anymore because nobody checked it. So so they they sued, they've won their case, or it's been settled for, for that one store, $625,000. I haven't got the, uh, the information on the other box stores, exactly how much each one of those box stores uh, around the mall, but they, they all have... Uh, you know, fought there, and that six twenty five is our portion. That is not, our portion. Not, yeah. That is <clears throat> our portion of the of the value decrease. So um, that alone, uh, you know, we're, we're faced with. Mister, on on this page right here, yes, you may not have the answer to this, but looking at the five point five mm -hmm. uh, increase, about what percentage would you say of that five point five is due to new houses, like new roofs? New, new construction, not not people's property values increasing. You know, last year we had about 1,300 new homes, and that, that was roughly 40% uh, of, the, of the increase. Um, I have asked the appraisal district for that information. I just have not I just have not got that yet from them. That would be nice to have because, yeah. as we talked about in our last workshop, the, the appraisal value going up, we don't actually receive that. As it is now, right. that's that's not part of money that the school district receives. So if if property values went up by ten percent, we net out zero of that because we give it all back to the state. So sometimes when people see that five point five, they think, oh, my property taxes are going up five point five for the school district, and that's just simply not the case. This has to do with the change in certified value, which is made up of not just property value, but also new, new homes, new, new construction, homes, new new, new malls, you know, all that exactly. kind of stuff as well. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And, and as soon as they get that uh, for me, I'll, I'll that'd be I'll great. Sure Thank you. See that. <clears throat> our state revenue allocation uh, allocations and our campus budget expenditures are based on our attendance data. Uh, for the coming year, we're using thirteen hundred and fifty students yeah. as a growth, giving us sixty four thousand one hundred eighty seven students, and uh, we're using ninety four percent. Um, for our average daily attendance increase, yes, sir. On, we, you mentioned the one percent increase, one cent increase. 
when is when do we need to make that? I know not tonight, of course, but oh, it's for that, not next, be next. It'll be next summer, twenty twenty one, next yes. August. Next yeah. August, we'll be next we'll year be addressing that. Um, so ninety four percent in our ADA, and there's just you know I always like to put this caveat in there. You know we budget based on our enrollment, but we're funded from the state based on our average daily attendance. Right. And with the changes in the state funding formula, that average daily attendance is going to be more and more important moving forward. So just about a month ago, we were here and we were talking about, uh, you know, where we were. And this is, this is our current law pro forma that, that y'all saw. And we had, a, we had a potential shortfall at that time of uh, $6.2 million. And I just wanted to give y'all a basis from where we were then. Now looking at House Bill 3, um, you know, it's showing the potential available funds of about $6.1 million. And I'll walk you through how we get there. We have a beginning revenue of $502.27 million. Um, our local revenue, based off of 5.5% AV growth, this is the first time since 2005 that I've seen a decrease on this line, will actually decrease our uh, tax revenue by $5.07 million. Uh, state funding, based on our 1,350 new students, will generate $38.72 million, uh, giving us a total revenue increase of $33.65 million. That'll leave us with an estimated total revenue of $535.92 million. Uh, on the expenditure side, our beginning expenditure is $495.46 million. Uh, the raise scenario, that, that scenario three that, that we first proposed, but we'll look at the other one, I think it was about a $400,000 change that Mr. Mr. Kidd talked about. 4% uh, salary increase for teachers, librarians, nurses, and counselors, $9.6 million. 3.5% uh, for full-time employees, excluding administrators, 2.8 million. 3% uh, administrative employees, 1.96 million. Uh, additional personnel for the growth of the incoming 1,350 new students, uh, 10.5 million. Uh, the pre-K dyslexia dropout recovery and comp ed programs. Um, you heard uh, Dr. Hines talk about pre-K. We have a $5 million figure in there uh, to hold that. Uh, other expenses, $4.5 million. $1.5 million of that is increasing the bilingual allotment. Uh, another uh, $1.5 million is our career and technology education allotment that we will have to, to increase to meet MOE for those two programs. And the other large expenditure in there is our uh, utilities for the new Suchman Elementary. Uh, that'll give us total estimated expenditure increase of $34.36 million giving us estimated total expenditures, $529.82 million, leaving us with potential available funds of $6.1 million. Hmm. Now with that, uh, we put together just some <coughs> available fund, you know, proposed uses. Um, you know, we need to retain the funding for new programs. What don't we know yet in House Bill 3? What may come out of, you know, House Bill 3 over the next few weeks? Um, you know, just like this afternoon at 3.30, we had a $7 million phone call that, that that could happen in the next few days. Um, and then if there's any funds remaining, we want to save any of the surplus uh, in the general fund budget to support the 2021 budget um, just because of the unknowns with that. And then, once again, any unforeseen expenditures. Can, yes, sir. Can you tell us how, how the $7 million ch ch change came about? Oh, today? Yes. Yeah. In, in regard to what you probably said, I just didn't hear yeah. that. Oh, oh what, what occurred with that? Well, the $7 million uh, phone call we got today is, is in the funding formulas that we have out there. If y'all remember the tax rate swap we talked about earlier, $1.6 to $1.4, within the calculations in, in, our, in our program that we have, uh, it didn't account for that decreasing from $1.6 to $1.4. Although we manually input in the data entry screen the, the tax rate changing to $1.4, it pulled from our, our current year tax rates within the calculation, and it and they, they had that error in there. So they thought said, we were gonna have two more golden pennies than we had. Yeah, pennies were. and so that's what it was, it was a golden <laughs> penny error uh, in the calculation, so. Well, um, we caught it. Well, they caught so, better, better we're really glad we got it this afternoon. But that's a, that's a math error. The un unintended consequences of some of the things that the state usually does anytime they change something. Yes. I mean. That's that's what we got to be forewarned and forearmed. We'll and and to be fair to the state, this was not the state. The state hasn't given us any information yet. Yeah, these are so these are the yeah, people region, that help us. Yeah, 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 region thirteen. So, right, uh, and John. You, I mean, you bring up an excellent point. So, there's a if it happened today, there's a chance it might happen tomorrow again as well. 
So we've got to be extremely careful. Well, I mean, I, I, they, they, they don't do many math. Yeah. <laughs> Whoever did the math there, that, 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 that's going to be the exception rather than the rule. But I promise you, when those things start working together, it, I mean, we saw a transportation thing that mm -hmm. cost us last year, mm -hmm. and it helped six out of the seven school districts in Montgomery County. Guess who the one that it didn't help right. was? Yes, sir. And, and I promise you, anytime they change something, that dollar for dollar thing on the miles and so on and so forth, there's always another shooter always fault. I mean, and I, I'm, I'm not, I mean, I'm not saying it's not intentional. They don't. It's just there's just too winners many and losers and everything. Tentacles that run through the run through the formula that they get you. I get that, John. And, and I'm, my point is, um, I think because of the 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 changes at the state level, I think there's still going to be some interpretation issues that. Oh, this is how we read it. No, this is how it's going to be applied because no one's done this yet, right? Sure. This is brand, brand spanking new stuff. The What we experienced today is what we knew our vulnerability was. Like Darren and I have been talking about this from the day, the first day the spreadsheets came out. Every time he sent me a run, I asked him every single day, did they get our dollar six and dollar four right? Mm -hmm. And on the surface of the spreadsheet they sent us because we input it, it looked right. But what they discovered today is on the back side of their yeah, spreadsheet, yeah. when the, where the formulas were, it didn't calculate it right. So this was the, that's not to say there won't be changes because there will be more in the future, but this was the one place where this giant vulnerability was. We just thought they had it right. Today we found out they didn't, but this is the, we knew this was the spot where we could see a big a big fall off and gotcha. If there's other changes yeah. coming, it's not going to be, it this won't be this. this, 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 we knew this was the big one that could be getting us. So explain, uh, we've got a $6 million surplus. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, uh, we're wanting to take 10 million, which is not in our budget. It's, it's excess reserve, right? Yes. And set up the maintenance camp. And your intent in ten, your intentions with the 6 million are to save it for a rainy day or another mistake or another gotcha. Yes, sir. Okay. This Make it yes. sure that I, I'm two different just, systems. Just two different two different systems. Yes. I, I got that. I'm just trying to keep it in my simple so, line, which and, is very simple, I trust. And to build to build on that, this is generating that that revenue is assuming what tax rate? Ninety seven cents. Ninety seven. Ninety-seven cents on the M and O side. On the M and O, and what about the others? But all in for the taxpayer. Well, well, this has has this still has twenty-four cents on the debt this service side. It doesn't. It doesn't have the debt, debt service, service increase. So, it. so you, it does not reflect the ten million dollars okay. coming yeah. back to the general. Okay. Here Fair enough. <clears throat> so once again, our our, our proposed uses. Uh, just a real quick on the fund balance analysis. <clears throat> Remember, on our fund balance analysis, twenty-five percent. We anticipate about $20 million available. And at the last board <coughs> workshop, we talked about, just want to remind y'all and make sure that we're all in agreement, the $10 million to start to fund the uh, general fund maintenance program, uh, finalize the purchase of the two tracts of land that are currently, that we currently have under, under contract, that's $8.5 million, and to uh, purchase school buses about $1.5 million of that. Okay. Um, Go ahead. So we're talking about from the general fund. I remember from the. This is this is the, this is coming fund. from the surplus over our twenty five percent of our fund balance okay. that 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 we have. It's twenty million dollars. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. And and these are the three things that we discussed. And, right. And I recall. Just wanted to mm -hmm. touch base with y'all again on that. How many buses would that buy us? About fifteen. Fifteen. Point five. Fourteen. Fifteen. But that's brand new. Brand new air conditions, yeah. seat belts, seat belts, everything. Yes. Are they yellow? Oh, okay. <laughs> they don't even put our name on the side. <laughs> That's for free. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they put your name on it for free. Bonus. And then, then just a, a, a what's next? Uh, we need to, you know, finalize our revenue. We're going to be monitoring the results of, of House Bill Three, uh, monitoring our local assessed values, working with uh, the appraisal district. Continue to finalize our expenditures as far as additional programs, uh, you know, with these new allotments with the bilinguals, the CTEs, et cetera. There'll be additional personnel ads. Um, working with TASB to finalize the compensation recommendation based on uh, House Bill 3, uh, finalize our campus and department expenditure budgets. Uh, future board meetings, public hearings, et cetera, on July 10th, I'll be presenting our budget to the district level planning and decision making committee. 
they will at that point make a recommendation that I'll bring to I'll bring to the board, and I plan on doing that at the July 16th board meeting. Um, our first public hearing on the budget is scheduled for August 6th. Our second public hearing is scheduled for August 20th, and at that time is when we will ask the board to adopt the budget and a proposed tax rate. And we do not have a July workshop scheduled at this point, but I think that I guess I just put it on your radar that maybe I think we we may need we may need it just based on there's so much up in the air that I agree. Um, I have a question since I, since golden pennies are worth two times. Yes. Okay. And we have accessed four of them. Okay. And we can't get to more than one, and it's a tax increase to get to it. Without a tax increase. Okay. Right. My simple question. It may be stupid, but how do, how can you if and I'm not saying it's a good idea or anything, but just say we went from ninety seven and a half to ninety six and a half this year, next year, whenever. Okay. Mm -hmm. We dropped it a penny. Do we drop off a golden penny or do we drop we off drop a golden penny? Yeah, golden those are the first ones to go. Yep. <clears throat> because the, 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 the MO tax rate for tier one calculation is 93 cents. So any tax above rate above that is a golden penny. So we would have to get below that. Below yeah. that. The state actually incentivizes you all to yes. raise the tax rate. I mean, that's, that's, right. the, that's the state's. As much as they can say one thing or another, I mean, the, the incentive is there for you to raise the local tax rate. Right. That is what the golden pennies and, are. And we've always used the golden pennies to fund the, the debt side. Yes. And now they're saying it's oil. At least our our, our reading of the of the tea leaves is that it's mm -hmm. illegal. Correct. And so it's just a loophole they closed. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it worked good while it did. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You want to circle back to the salary slide just real quickly, and let's just get... Is there, Mr. Kidd had, had made a mention of, of wanting us to look at the. Um, That's the difference. I, I would like to, to look at that 443 scenario. I'm, I'm leery of giving some professional staff four and other professional staff three. I'm more, I'm more in line with maybe one or two, maybe two, four, four, four two and a half. Yeah, I'm. I'm more I'm, I'm I'm okay with with two as well. I I, I don't like splitting those first two rows I to different rates. I, I hear you and I agree with that. Well, and and to be clear, just so that we make sure we're all on the same page here, all those folks that you mentioned earlier, like LSSPs and DIAGs, they would fall under the administrative, not the all other um, category. Okay. Like they're in the they're in the administrative education pay scale, so they'd be okay. more. And you know, unless we go carve them out. They're going to fall under that level. All that, all other category is primarily hourly employees. Doctor Nova, okay. can you quickly touch on why those those categories fall under administration? Because it always seems it looks like we are heavy in administration and not curriculum, and I think that's one of the reasons why. Well, yeah, they're they're, they're curriculum. They're just yeah, but they're, know, they're but they're classified as administration. Well, they're, that's just because they're not. Um, as far as when we report, I don't know how they were, if they were reported under curriculum or they reported yeah, under administration. They're reported under curriculum, but they on, are. The pay, on the pay scale, really, we just have three different options. We have the teacher librarian mm -hmm. pay scale, then we have the administrative business, administrative yeah. education. I think salary description uh, or uh, levels and what applies to the 60 some odd percent that we put towards instruction are two mm -hmm. different, totally different animals. So they're, they're, they count towards that instruction. Mm -hmm. And what are we up to, 63 yeah. now, 62, whatever, whatever? It's in the 60s, the low 60s. What, whatever it is, okay? We're above the, the average on what we pay and uh, yeah. what, we, what we fund in instruction. Yes. But as far as salary structure, that, that's a totally different thing than whether they're part of curriculum or not, or, mm -hmm. you know, teaching kids. Yeah, how they're coded on the backside as far as... What you're referring to is different from which pay scale they 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 fall in. But as it relates to this, you saying they're in the administrative budget. They're in the yes, budget. correct, Darren. Yes, like all of those in those I, boxes. Yeah, I, I think they be in the. That, yeah, that's I, what I, 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 if kids sit in front of them, I, I think they should be in a one or two. That's my most simplistic way of viewing it. If they got a, if they got kids in front of them that they interact with, as opposed to interacting with, with adults, as administration in this building does, I think they should be in either one or two. But do we have the, we don't have the option to do that, right? Well, we can we can adjust whatever. Yeah, I mean that's a 
Thank you. That was a very succinct way of putting it as far as, as we were having our debate earlier about um, who should fall in which category. That's a fairly clean way to, yeah, exactly. for us to classify it. They see kids. Yeah. That's how I, that's how my little mind. <laughs> so they're not administrators. So we could take, we could go in and take that approach of if, if they have kids sit, seated in front of them, they fall in the all other category for whatever percentage you all would choose there. And then everyone else would be in the administrative but percentage. I, I just, respectfully, I mean, everybody on the list is our educators. Correct. Sure. Agree. And, and even though they don't have children in front of them, I, I, I feel like we're, we're kind of in this mode because of events over the last couple months. So, I mean, I, I think to go below just because of a category called administrators are still all educators and to go lower than what we usually do on an annual basis. But let's remember why administrators are at a lower, I mean, first of all, the salary structure is two different in, in, in two, wait a minute, hear me out now. Okay. Two and a half, I, I don't care whether they go see kids or not. If they're making a hundred thousand and a teacher's making 50,000 and you give the fifty thousand a three percent raise, and the and the hundred thousand a two and a half percent raise. You see how that 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 blends equity. That's why it's always been suggested that it's different. I'm sorry, administrators. I, I'm just I'm just pointing out an obvious fact that two and a half percent of a higher salary structure when you work in the administrative department versus a teacher on the campuses, which is is much more flatline. Uh, the numbers work out different. Yeah, well, to Scott's point, I wouldn't. We weren't assessing. We we weren't committing to any one of these percentages. We were just trying to. Oh no, I know. I'm talking okay. more like. And, and I understand what John's saying too, but I I was more so addressing your your point. We weren't necessarily saying that we should give one one versus the other. We were just saying categorization. It just seemed like categories categorization of those as administrators was correct. That's all I was saying. Well, if if I could just say, I don't know who all has asked for what so far, but. I mean, if, if it answers the problem to put the first two at three and a half and the second one at two and a half and, and go to the house, I'd like to see that number because I'm concerned about every two million. I mean, I, it's not that I don't want to give two more million in raises. I'd rather give the 19.9, but I think we've got some uncovered, uh, you know, uh, hellos coming and, 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 uh, I don't mean any more math errors. I don't know. You know, I'm not. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying. I think we've got some stuff coming up that that we just don't know. Used to we could rely on Darren because he's been doing the formula long enough. Well, it's a new formula, and hello, he doesn't know, and nobody else. Does. They don't nobody even know. Knows. What were those numbers you just said? John? Three and a half. Three half. Three and a half. Two and a half. Okay. So it just equals. It doesn't matter what category they're in, unless they're true administrators. I mean, or whoever's in that. Yeah. And we and. To, to be clear, like, and this is confusing because of the way the pay grades are set up and the way the legislature um, passed this rule because they passed a rule for teachers, librarians, nurses, and counselors. Mm -hmm. Well, our teachers, librarians, and nurses are on our teacher pay scale, but our counselors are in our AE pay scale, and they're in, I think, box three or four, three. somewhere over there. And so that was part of our debate today was, okay, well, they have to get the larger piece of the pie because that's what the state mandated. Mm -hmm. So what about all the people in the same box with them? What about the people in the box above them or below them? And th those are the people you're referring to. There's some LSSPs and SLPs and th all those type of folks. And so we need to spend a, a little more time yeah. trying to trying to to break that out. So well, you'd like to see a three and a half, three and a half, two and a half model. We can run that model, certainly. I like to see the same model with the classifications changes. Yep. Okay. Same models as John, I'm sorry, Mr. Husband is saying. I just want the classifications to change. So what was the name of the title specifically well, you were mentioning? No, I, I didn't really have a title specific, but I think the... Learning coach or something. Yeah, I was talking about teach. I don't know where a, um, I don't know where a literacy coach falls. I don't know if they're administration or, or, or all others. We, I think we would I, consider those to be a teacher. Okay, so... I'm I'm just talking out loud, but yes. I think that would be one of the when we when I see administrators, I'm obviously thinking APs, principals, thinking about people in the office. But there's other people. We're finding out there's other 
mm-hmm. titles that are in that administration. So, right. so what I wouldn't want to happen mm-hmm. is to do a three and a half, three and a half, two and a half with all others being, and I don't, I'm just making, yeah. because I don't know, I don't know all the codes, but one of those all others being a uh, you know, cafeteria help, right? But then a literacy coach, and I'm making this up, being in administration, not getting that pay raise, right? Like someone else. And, and like you know, Mr. Williams said, if you're in front of a student, if you're in front of children, and you're trying to impact their learning capability and what all they can advance, I wouldn't want to hold that that person so back. Let me let me student. check your pulse on this. <laughs> Go ahead. District level instructional coach. Okay, so they were a master teacher on their campus. They they now are employed here in our science department and they are a science coach and their job is to go out and help grow teachers that's what they do they go out and help grow teachers they're um they don't have a, you know they don't evaluate the teachers they're they're basically to coach the teachers is what right. they do um let me give you that's a that's a that's an example of they, their primary role is not yep. to interact <laughs> with students but but they do interact with students when they go Absolutely. in and, and but so does an assistant principal all day. Yeah. <laughs> so. I, don't, I don't know if she's not here. I don't, I don't mean to pick her on, but like Tamika, she spent so much time at that campus this year. If she, you know, but she's obviously still an administrator. Yeah. So, I mean, Dr. Dr. Noel, you, uh, you, can, you can make that argument for yourself. True. Right. Well, well I, I think, I think I we have a rebuttal, but not please. a rebuttal, but my answer to that is, is as I'm, I'm listening to everybody. Yeah. I would rather see it three and a half across the board for everybody. That would be my answer for that. And then it doesn't really matter what their classification is in here, personally. I'm just talking about, we're, this is a workshop. We can talk yeah, about yeah. You suggest to, when you, when you give a police, and all others, when you give a policeman a 3% raise on his salary, and you give Dr. Null a 3% raise on his salary, you've done two different things. I agree. Yes. Okay. I, that's I, I why agree. it's separated. So can I, can I make one possible suggestion here? And, and we need to do our homework on this, but the way the salary structure works, they're they're in boxes. So you have your AE1s, 2s, 3s, 4s, you know, it goes by category. Um, we can go in and look. We understand counselors need to fall into the level with teachers. So we can go in and look at that level and everybody that's in that box and above. So three, two, and one, potentially getting the bigger raise, to your point, because as you go higher in the box number, the higher the salary goes. So perhaps that's the delineation where the counselors sit at three. So everybody in AE one, two, and three gets the teacher raise. Everybody four and down, because they're higher salaried, they get the the administrative raise and that might be the well, cleanest that simplest way simplest. and it that might be yeah but i'm also leaning towards scenario one for the simple fact that the allotment of 12.4 is kind of where i'm at for several reasons one is we don't know if this is going to last more than two years no nobody knows and then as john has said hey if we we give it in year number three from now the teachers are going to they're going to expect that, and I think that they should, and we're going to have to build that into a budget. <clears throat> Second of all, we've got these things to look at next mm-hmm. that we have to find funding for these projects that have to be done. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> they have to be done. So I'm not sure that it makes sense to go above what, this, what the state allotment is for any kind of raise at this mm-hmm. point. Okay, that's fair. So oh, well, yeah. we, we can... Allow us to do our homework so we can tighten the numbers up based on some of what we've heard tonight and give you all better numbers. We can show you, we'll show you that additional scenario you've asked for. Um, it sounds like we're going to need to have more conversation on this in yeah. the future, which is understandable. This is a big deal. It so is. Yeah. We'll, figure, we'll figure that moving forward. So, um, all right, thank you. We got, we got great feedback. We needed yeah. that we got, on those we got, items. We got, so, yeah. one last yeah. yeah. question. Um, for some of those positions that are funded from alternative sources, like their funding comes from Title One or something, mm-hmm. they're not affected. They're still the same pay structures. I mean, they, it looks on paper like yes. their funding comes from. Yes. They're getting paid the they'll, same. They'll level get the yes. yes, all the same. All right. Very good. All right, our last two items of the night are fairly quick, and I know we're pushing up against our time. And Chris is going to be real quick. Um, I will. <laughs> I think that was a mandate. He got here before anybody else did this morning, anyway. 
I think Daytree's sitting on my hands now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll, yeah. Go, we'll go real fast. Uh, Hand cut. Just, just a couple of things to point out. Uh, is this, on? Is this, on? <laughs> this this first map, and I'm not going to go into any detail. So, it, but this first map is a current look at our uh, Washington and Pete Peter uh, maps. And as you know, we'll be um, not next year, but the year after, opening Stockton Junior High, and we, we're going to start the rezoning process. Uh, this year to try to bring more balance to create some room at Pete, which is uh, at capacity uh, Take advantage of the additional seats at Stockton and still allow for growth that we know is coming uh, on the west side and really all over the Congo area, so um, That that is something we'll work on just 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 want to point that out. Did you have well, one? Did you have can, one? can you can you tell us what, what those numbers look like right there or for probably? We're not proposing. This is not a proposal. Not a proposal. This, this is current. This is just, this is just what we have. We, we just, won't, we, okay. our, our timeline will be more like January when we do the final. We'll go through yeah. that whole process. It'll take the whole semester. In there. But this is what we have currently. Yeah, and, the, and, the, and all the little subunits are just planning units. Those are how we plan. <laughs> um, and we'll probably divide some of those as we get closer to this process. Um, but they, those represent, those little letters and numbers you see are just something we use for planning units. So each of those represents a certain number of people that live in those units, and so we, we use those. Mm -hmm. uh, What's as far outside? I was just curious area. what the split is right now. Yeah, yeah so the split, uh, you can see we go a little bit on both sides of uh, 75, uh, and but you but some of it doesn't. Uh, you can look, there's some areas on Pete, the far. Pete has about 1,450, and Washington has oh, about I'm sorry, Roman. I'm sorry. numbers. Yeah, about 1,500 yes. to about 900. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. About 1,500 to <laughs> 900. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> 15 to Mr. Sanders had a question. Was, yes. What's this purple outlier out here, way out to the right? So that is part of Washington's attend. I mean, uh, Pete's attendance zone that goes across. Um, which is out, really those are areas that go to uh, Bosman mm -hmm. and came from Austin Elementary. And so just they've always gone over to Pete. We've just not moved them. <laughs> it always have. Wow. And, um, and it's a lot of bus ride. And there's, it is a long bus ride, but at the same time, we haven't had the capacity. So we will have the capacity, and obviously those They'll your eyes back. look right yeah. there. It's one of the first places. Actually, yeah, actually, it isn't near as far as from your house. Are you ready to redraw this? Let's not let's not present something like that. <laughs> <laughs> don't make us. No, no. Yeah. I won't bring you that. Don't make us. Yeah. Hold on. Yeah. I got that. That's, I got that's that. not a gift. I'll bring you that. So. Yeah, well, Get a checkerboard. No. If we had to switch <laughs> yeah, schools, we had to switch schools, but let's not make it that way. Yeah, we will. We will not do that. This is our current uh, kind of a, a look at our high school zones for the South County high schools. You can see the Grand Oaks, Oak Ridge, and College Park in the Woodlands. And uh, this is an area we're not doing anything with yet, but certainly we've talked about if, if we have a bond in November and if it doesn't pass and we're not going to put classrooms at Woodlands and College Park, we certainly have started the planning, started thinking about what ifs, how do we take advantage of those seats at Oak Ridge and do right. some shifting. Um, this this next map represents a change, and and really what we did is we this is a simple one. It moves, uh, and this is just one example. We haven't done anything with it too too in depth, but this moves um, Harper's Landing into the Oak Ridge feeder. It moves some areas <coughs> that are currently in the woodlands over to College Park, and it moves some areas actually that are at College Park into the woodlands to try to create some balance. Yeah. Um, it makes certainly if nothing else a nice looking map, um, but the, those are some potential changes. Timber Lakes, Timber Ridge moves in there. Um, we moved some things along 242 corridor and 1488 corridor. So it, it certainly just to kind of go back, you can see that top else, so. top left that would go back one slide. Top left, that's uh, that's Old Conroe that's Road. That's Old Conroe Road. So that'd be that would stay on, Woodlands on the west side of Old Conroe Road, and 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 some of that has to do with we need those where they go to elementary and intermediate. Yeah. And so we still need to fill up our schools and keep them at capacity. And, and that area feeds into Bush Elementary and Mitchell. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the future, there's growth going on in Foster's Ridge, which really our plan, and, and, it, and, it, and it really does work from a location standpoint, is Buckaloo is going to have capacity. And so that's kind of our overflow plan. So okay. thinking ahead of the future, we anticipate... Bush going overcrowded. We anticipate oh. rezoning to Buckaloo to take advantage of that. But we're not going to fix the the uh, Foster's whatever ridge to 
to Buckaloo and not fix the whole shift on the elementaries in the woods that need fixed? Well, we we could. Uh, so well, there's let me let me kind of fast forward. Say, when, we can do you, whatever you, you want. We, us we to talked do. about putting it off yes. at, when we did the Grand Oak the, the shift uh, for uh, for Irons. I mean uh, for Suchma. And then, and and now we're talking about filling one elementary when we really need to do a whole shift. So if we, so, yeah, just to be clear, let me if I can jump in for a minute, sure. Chris, go back if you would. This is not a plan that we want to do. Let's be clear about this. No, okay, this is not. Okay. This is the if if we do not have a successful bond in November of 2019. Or, or moving forward, we're not going to do additions to the Woodlands High School and College Park High School. This is yeah. the map we would use. We do not want okay. to put this map in play because it does affect a lot of families and their high school feeders, and we do not. Not this one. And we've never done that. The next, no, the next, the next one. one. That one. one. We. This is not what we want to do. That's just to be yeah. clear. Saying that, that it this is, is a lot cleaner. Though. This is a reality of what we would have to do. I think if, Dr. Moe, you have to, now, you have to if, plan for those kids. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Know. Just in case. Is, I'm, I'm, good. One. I'm good. I don't know they, why we're shying away from us. understanding what the expectations are. Um, so that shift in the elementaries in the woodlands, yes, is something that we need to do, and that's what Chris is going to show next. But it would look very different if we have to go to this high school plan. Right. We would be shifting then the elementaries to get them into the appropriate feeders. Sure. Uh, if if we did have a successful bond, we weren't going to change high schools. We could go in and do a shift in the woodlands, and that's what I think um, Chris's next slide is. We could still do a high school shift, an elementary shift in the woodlands, but we would not be changing anyone's high school feeder. Right. It would just be utilizing capacity. And it's a great clarification. So I'm sorry this, that I, I no, that's missed right. that. And yeah, I, that's right, and I important. probably should put this one up first. This is the, the woodlands in the College Park elementary feeder zones. And as we, we talked about last year, we have crowding at uh, Ride. We have yes. some at Glenlock. Uh, Powell's pushing the edge, uh, and so we're watching that carefully. We'll be watching Ford. Ford keeps getting it. Uh, uh, not Ford. Uh, Lamar keeps Lamar. growing. Yeah. So we're watching that. We should see Haley come down about 100 this year, so we're going to watch those. But we have room at Gladys, Derrickson, uh, Tuff moving forward. And so really, we know that we need to do some things to fix it. And at this point, I certainly recommend we wait to the outcome of the bond before we go do it, because that'll change the approach. If we're just going in to fix some elementaries, that's one thing. If we're going to, if we're going to change the high school feeder pattern, we would approach it differently, if that makes any sense. Yeah, we would try to get, oh, sure. It does. We, would, we would try to get people in the right feeders. It makes sense. Um, so that's that's something we need to address. We'll probably get a later start on this one um, in later November, but it is something that we plan. Plus, it actually helps us to get the year started and see what our numbers look like, so we can see what the trends are. Um, well, look, for for clarification, though, we haven't we don't have a bond for November. I know we're going to talk about some things, but the couple of slides before, a couple of slides before, I had asked we had asked to come back with some other options other than. So if there is no bond, this is an option. And we're not talking about 2019, 2020, we're talking about 20 to 2021 planning, correct? Or was this something, I mean, obviously- we could, no, This is not something we put into play for this next school year. I mean, it could be yes, a future. Right. And absolutely, that'd be your, I mean, if you all made a yes. decision that whether you wanted to have a bond or you didn't, if you wanted to enact a map, you could, it, like I said, there, we have a typical process that we would go through and um, right. beyond that. But this would be if if we felt like we just had to make this change happen, and it's that is your decision as a board. You know. But this would be like the, the same year that you're opening in Stockton. Yeah, I mean, you know, yes, correct. It, and all it, this it would be some mid midway next yeah. year. No, no, no. All this is, all this is addressing is overcrowding at some of the campuses. It doesn't, th this rezoning, if that was a scenario, does not really account, that accounts for what we have today, not the growth that's coming in every single year, no. Correct. not what the state Correct. is mandating on, on pre-K, okay. Correct. all of those things. We still have to expand even Absolutely. if we just yes. do this. What we, would, what we would be doing is right now, we have some capacity at Oak Ridge High School with the opening of Grand Oaks. Sure. Um, high school capacity is obviously at a premium because high schools are so expensive to build. Yes. Um, 
as part of the last bond plan, there was an addition at College Park, there was an addition at the Woodlands mm -hmm. to basically um, serve the, the students that are currently there, bring them out of portables and, and make the schools reach the capacity that, that, that are their current population. If we didn't have, if we did not have a bond moving forward, or if in the future you decided you didn't want to do additions at those two schools as part of any future bond, you just wanted to shift kids over to Oak Ridge, you could do that. Now what that does is that would take all of our available capacity in South County for high school seats would be gone. You know, we would, we would be using all of our available capacity and we, so we'd have no flexibility. Having capacity at Oak Ridge High School is a strategic advantage for us based upon its location. It is very central in South County. So having some capacity there allows us some flexibility that if we'd made this shift, we would fill that school up completely and we would have, you know, we right. know Grand Oaks is gonna go over capacity soon. Yeah, it's just, just that just Dr. No, right it, it, just when you use the term capacity, <clears throat> I mean, shouldn't we really say temporary capacity? Because I mean, when you split those schools, I mean, yes, you know, Conroe got hit three right. different times right. when they split all these theater zones off. Right. And then, but it comes right. now here it comes back. And so you, you're saying capacity, but, and it may go down when uh, uh, you get past the kids that had the election to stay. Right. But then it's going to start coming back on its own if we don't do anything. Correct. That's right. And so using that capacity now and yes. having to build another high school or whatever, right. I mean, it's just... That's what it I'm only saying. Only has so yeah. many seats. Agreed. That's what I mean. It's if you use them all up now, then you don't have them in the future. Yeah. And you're speaking from experience from yes. right here in CISD, John. Yes, right? well, it's going to well, grow. I mean, we know. We've, we've all seen it in in, in in you know Conroe High School. I mean, right. uh, Oak Ridge. Let's let's go back to Oak Ridge. It has capacity. It's it how big now? Nearly three thousand. Twenty-eight. Yeah, current. Twenty-five. Currently, what are they? Thirty. Which Are one? Oak Ridge. Oak, Oak Ridge, 22 at the big yeah, campus 22. and about 1250 at the other one. So yeah. About 34. Yeah. So there's not, not a lot of room there. All right. And there'll be a little over 3,000. Anything else, Chris, on the zone? I was just going to point out the junior high is another area we'll have to address. York is, we'll have to decide for York if we don't, if we don't want to do anything in terms of adding on to York or if we don't move forward. We will have to solve for the junior high um, solution for York and, and and again you know obviously we just showed one possibility but there are ways to approach it um, and we would have to look at that we'll also have to solve for Moorhead and um, and that's another one that we don't have a good plan for right. um, we you know the reality is junior high seats are probably the most premium right now and we'll, we'll, we'll increase yeah. we'll increase a few when we open stock but, but as you know with growth those are going to get eaten up pretty fast sure so. but where do you have capacity i mean i, I don't understand what you're saying right, software right now we have about for, we could take about 200 more at irons we just opened that wing well, yeah, okay. yeah so we have right we there. have a little yeah. bit there you know one example is if we took an area going down Rayford, uh, let's just say Legends Ranch, and moved them to Knox and took Harper's Landing over to um, to uh, Irons, we could make room at York. Um, we could keep the other, we could fill up Irons. But what we would do is, and we would just have to know it, is we would be creating, for those three junior highs, they would not, uh, for two of those junior highs, they'd be split. They'd be the only ones like that in our district where they don't, they're not pure feeders no. to a high school. Yeah. So, you know, there are solutions. Some are better looking yeah. than others, but certainly those are things that we'll, we'll yeah. need to look at or start looking at depending on if we want to do a bond, if we have a bond and it's not successful. Some of those things we're going to have to start thinking about. So there's no decision to be made here tonight. This is just kind of letting you know what we're looking at and starting to think about. Thank you. Sure sure. Thank you. Okay. All right, our last thing tonight, I believe you have a handout, and uh, Easy and I are going to kind of partner up on this one, but I'm going to try to drive us through a little bit, um, and it'll be on your screen as well, it's Conroe High School. Um, as part of our planning of the last bond, and really as part of the 2015 plan, I'm going to take you all the way back four years ago. As part of the 2015 Facility Planning Committee, that's, was that the one you were on? So Mr. Moore was a member of that committee. That was the Facility Planning Committee that committed to the Conroe High School Master Plan. It was a 2015 bond committee. And as you know, we've completed 
phase one of that master plan, and you can see that it's on your slide now, and it's on page um, two in your handout. That is where we currently are at Conroe High School. That is a overhead map of the of the school, and it's what's good. that light blue portion is what's been completed as that new addition. So that's where we currently stand with this building. As part of the um, last um, bond program in May, we had phase two of the Conroe High School master plan on the um, included in the bond package. So what you can see here is, we, we've talked about this before, but the basic overview flips the front door to the back side, um, relocated athletics to where the current freshman annex is and moved CTE over here closer to 105. Uh, it brought all of the students under one roof um, and worked to address and mitigate as much as possible the number of level changes within the building. And I believe there are 27, if I'm right, Ian, 27 different elevation changes within the building at Conroe High School, which, um, as you can imagine, causes a mobility concern for, for a lot of students and staff. Um, so all of those things were addressed in this master plan, um, really would have extended the life of the building out another at least 60 years um, as part of the program. Now this plan in the previous bond package, easy, we had what amount allocated? Uh, what went to the voters in May was about 147 million. So to complete this total plan is $147 million. So as we look to the future, um, we wanted to bring forward maybe some potential options for you. One option, which I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on because I, we just don't recommend it, would be completing the Conroe High School Master Plan but breaking it up into two more phases instead of one. So a phase two and a phase three. But our end result would be the same. The challenges there are it would take, we, that school would be under construction. It's already been under construction for two years. It would be under construction for probably a number, another eight years. Um, we would have to go not just in this bond, but in a future bond, asking for money once again for Conroe High School. And because of the length of construction, um, it would cost significantly more to complete the project if we did that. So that is not a recommendation. Um, what you will see on five, page five, is what the end result of the previous master plan would look like. Um, where everything would be. So you can see new athletics there. You can see um, those things. So this is roughly a $150 million plan. Yes, sir, Mr. Husbands. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I just noticed something that, that uh, uh, I didn't think was possible. Okay. And that's the road around the back. Yes. It is possible. It's possible. Yes, sir. Since when? Because all I heard was, you know, you're not going to, you're going to have to shift those fields. Are we still shifting the football fields? Well, we we the practice fields. Yeah, we've dug in a little bit deeper here recently with a little more hard Something's concrete changed. dimensions. Not nothing. I mean, the property lines haven't moved, but the uh, ideas of of how much of the field needs to move to make it happen. Okay. So we talked about it moving the bleachers. Yes, and, it can be done. Yeah. Yes, sir. So, I, onwards and upwards. I just yes, it can be done. That we didn't forget where the property line no, was. No, it something. can be done. So I've that is that the, for a few years. That's the only reason I bring it up. I mean, not like I made it up. So this is the master plan as envisioned in 2015, as what we started working with of the work that we did this last time. But as part of future planning for Conroe High School and knowing that that was a large number, we I, I challenged Easy and his team to look at other possible solutions. And so that's what you see on this next page here. Option C um, is a still a master plan of Conroe High School, but it is not the same master plan. It is reducing the scope of work at Conroe High. Um, so you, you can see that we would, um, basically athletics would stay in the same area where athletics is. There would be an addition of a new gym there, but it would basically stay in that same general area. Um, where the annex currently is, is where the CTE programs would go. Um, this would come at, a reduced cost, okay? That there, that's the benefit of this program. Now, if you go to the next page, I just wanna show you this kind of chart of pros and cons, and we're really gonna ignore B. Option A pros, so this is the, the original Conroe High School master plan 
gets everybody under one roof, new CTE, new athletics, the facade on the outside, auditorium, athletics, everything will match. The, the whole building when it's done will be done. Um, we would get the work done, you know, as compared to B and the faster timeline. The negative with option A is the upfront cost. Certainly, it's a large number. The other negative to, Conor, to, to option A is for some folks that love Conroe High School, it's a, it's a, um, a lot to swallow as far as a change goes for, for some folks that have been here for a long time. Um, it is a lot, it's a, a large amount of change. When you look at option C, um, once again, option A is about 150 million. Option C, we still um, are able to get under one roof. We still get new CTE programs. We get a new competition gym, but we would not. We would still utilize the old gyms. Um, it's be the shortest to complete because it's the smallest scale uh, program. It is the 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 least expensive option, and it would allow us, for nostalgia's sake, to keep some items like the pit gym and and potentially keep the front door on 105. We might can move the car rider line off of 105, but we could keep the front door on 105 if that was very important to the community. The negatives there are um, you know, we would be limited on the amount of facade changes that we could do on the current building. Um, once again, we're still going to be utilizing two 60-year-old know, gyms. Um, the parking lots will remain asphalt. We'll, we won't have money to go to concrete. Um, some portions of the older part of the building, like the library, wouldn't be able to be addressed. And then, um, you know, on the inside, we would not be able to mitigate all of the elevation changes because this is a, a smaller project. So we would still have a lot of those elevation changes and it would just, it wouldn't be as seamless as option A. Option C, is roughly a hundred and twenty million dollar project. So you're looking at about a thirty million dollar, right? Easy, roughly. Yeah, I mean it's still very conceptual, but I mean yeah. the, the savings is not drastic. No, it's oh, roughly comparison. a thirty. We were hoping to find an option like C that might be a fifty or sixty million dollar savings. Truthfully, that it, that's not that's just not the reality of what costs are. Um, so my question is. You know, as I meet with community members, I can present both of these and get feedback on both of these and, and bring you that information in the future. But if there's something here that you don't like or do like, I'd love to hear your opinions now so that I can know that moving forward. A couple of questions. What is the difference in student educational space capacity between A and C? Well, the original master plan wasn't to change the building capacity overall at all. I mean, we've we've created some swing space to allow the master plan to go forward in some fashion, but at the end of the project, we haven't really increased the capacity of Connor High School. It's still going to be a pretty big high school, but it'll still be in the 3,500, 4,000 range when you've got the ninth grade center to go with it. So A and C, the same capacity? Yes. Overall. What's our what's our objective? The $30 million savings? Yes. I mean, as an option. If you want to call it a savings. Uh, Correct. Yeah, yeah, it's as really a, a reduction in cost. Yes, a reduction in cost of $30 million. Now, I do think the a concern or the reality would be, you know, a future board would, would likely be faced with the idea of coming back later and finishing that job, and it would cost more in the future to, to finish it. Um, First, I, please go ahead, John. I, I mean, to speaking as one of those yes. that are a, as a Conroe High graduate, I think uh, we celebrated with the 117th graduation, and I think I heard that option A was looking at a 60 year, and that's what's important, I think. And uh, to me, you know, why nickel and dime to go 30? I know that's a lot of money, I don't mean to make light of that, uh -huh. but I think in, in the investment for our future and as John and I would say, our glory past, I think option A. Is, uh, is a, uh, I, John. Just, I'd go one step further. I'd, I'd say that you're hearing the, the, the community is confused. Okay. They think that we're building Conroe High School up to stay, keep it a one high school theater zone. Right. When in effect, it has nothing to do with another high school being built besides Stockton one day because that's still going to happen whether you do this or not. 
whether you spend $30 million, $130 million, or $180 million, you're still going to have to build another high school, and that's what they're – they think that we're doing this in spite of that. That's the confusion. Also, and I am not in this camp, and nor do I, but I am going to call it what it is. Some people are confused that if you put two high schools in Conroe today, that – the old Conroe High School would go back to being significantly whiter. And I'm just telling you the honest to God truth. You can kick me off the board or anything else. That ain't going to happen, okay? And it doesn't matter what they think. It won't change. And uh, I just I just think that they're working on some uh, misguided ideas of what a renovation of Conroe High School. We're renovating Conroe High School because it's wore out. Okay, not to make it bigger, not to keep from building another high school. That's still coming when the time is right. But they don't want to divide Conroe High School right now because you'd be about 2A, wouldn't you? Or whatever. I mean, you know, 3, yeah. 5A, whatever. Yeah. I mean, it wouldn't be 6A, let me tell you that. It, it, the glory days of so, <clears throat> something that they have nostalgia in their minds, it is what it is. And it still needs to be done in spite of another high school being needed before 2024 or whatever. So I, I think I think there's some confusion about that, and I think it needs to be straightened out. So maybe I said too much, but I, that's my honest opinion. They also observe all the brick on their school to match, right. uh, you know, for the difference in the money. Sure. Thank you, sir. Who's got a question for Easy and or Marshall, actually? Differences in A and C... Is there any long-term maintenance benefit or cost one? Is C using uh, a smaller chiller or a lower grade something that's going to cost us? You know, we're going to have to replace a chiller in 10 years instead of 20 years or something like that. No, that wouldn't be the intention at all. It's really just not affecting the building transformation as much. The, the equipment, I mean, the, the major equipment for the project has already been bought and installed. I mean, so that equipment was bought and designed to serve about 600,000 square feet, which is what we've got and what we'll end up with when we're done. I mean, so the big major maintenance items will be handled in either in either fashion, and it'll be handled in the fashion like we've been working with Marshall over the last, you know, five or six years since I've been here at the district, is trying to put in the best equipment we can to get the longest uh, maintenance and, and service life out of it, and then work, work the building around that rather than work in the other direction, if that makes sense. Yeah, I just want to make sure that that $30 million savings wasn't going to cost us. In the big in the money savings, yeah. the gyms versus CTE switch, isn't, Say that, again? isn't that where the big money is? Well, I mean, and when you look at the plans, really no, because you're still getting a new competition gym out of building out of option C, but you're having to go into the pit and into the current athletics where they're at, which is where a lot of the elevation problems are. Well, that's and, what I'm saying. You yeah. try to mitigate if those. You don't, if you don't do away with those two old gyms, Right. Okay, you're saving a lot of money. Correct. Not the new gym that's being built regardless either place. And then CTE to the where the annex is mm -hmm. is a lot cheaper than pulling it over here to the pit. Well, I mean, yes and no. I mean, that, and that's really where we're talking about the $30 million swing. Well, I mean, because there's, there's not a huge difference. I mean, well, it's $30 million, isn't it? Right, okay. but either way, the annex goes away. That building I mean, the gets, football field, moving the football field is not, is not really a lot of the money. Well... But moving the football field, moving the parking lots, and doing all the site infrastructure is, is, is cumulates to about that $30 million difference. So option C really stays away from the site and the major, you know, the, the major building transformation pieces. But when you build one big competition gym and then renovate two older facilities, you're still going to spend about as much money as we would be building three new gyms and three new locker rooms. Oh, we're or still not three. two old gyms. They're right. just going to be renovated. I mean, so and so that's we were hoping to have the uh, have the exercise just like you're describing that we're going to reuse the building. But in fact, we're reusing the building structure where the pit and all the athletics are anyway. So we weren't going to scrub that all the way to the dirt and build back up for CTE. We were going to reuse those structures uh, because they've got good bones in them. Uh, they just need to be organized for the and they they're quite suited with the elevations and the ceiling heights of, of those spaces they work very well for reuse as cd programs i mean so but after ian and his team uh, worked kind of the shell game a little bit uh, the difference in plan a and plan b wasn't as drastic as we were hoping and a lot of that is and there's really not a big separation in the athletics 
renovated where it's at or building new up the hill because there's obstacles in the way of both of those programs, like it says. So a lot of the cost savings does come from the lack of mitigation of the elevation changes within the building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So really, that's where your right. savings are. Yeah. Because you're not moving, what you're, to your point, John, you're not moving the gyms and all those things, but you will be left with the same challenges. Yeah. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. I think you still, you still have the traffic on 105, which we have yet to see what that's going to end up being. Yeah, and, and that's when we, we, we spent some time talking about, uh, like if you leave the front office on 105, yeah. let's so move the, the parent that's traffic to Longmire Drive. So the the stacking that happens on, on the highway is on a side street or on the uh, more of our property. Uh, but that means you're dropping your kids off at the back door, not the front door. So there's a little perception to go with, with that conversation as well. One of the things that the feedback I got from this lesson, and one of the messages I tried to convey was the safety and security mm -hmm. uh, that, that comes with having all those students under one roof yes. and not crossing back and forth. Um, and, and, whatever we decide to go with. Look, I, I think that message needs to to be elevated a little bit in this next round of discussions with the public. One of the comments I got was, well, I can hire the 101st Airborne to patrol Wilson Road for cheaper than $147 million and protect the kids. But they don't understand the broader scope of safety and security with mm -hmm. having all of your kids in that one building for whatever the emergency may be. Right. Um, yeah, so. when, it, when it's not daylight savings time, and these parents come through here after dropping their kid off safely, 90 to nothing, and you can't even see the kids crossing the street right here on 105, which is seven lanes that they're crossing and they're turning. You know, you, you cannot, I mean, you know, you cannot see. And, uh, uh, you know, they, they speak of safety and, and, and security and concern for our children, and we're worried about connecting six buildings. Well, I'm just worried about them getting flattened out here like a pancake. You know, if if somebody isn't paying attention to what they're doing, they're more worried about getting to work on time. Yeah. And and that's worth something. Uh -huh. uh, I don't and, know if it's thirty million or right. I wasn't, I wasn't making light of the the thirty million, but okay. what I was hearing is that over sixty. I mean, we, a long term. Long yeah. Term, yeah. and that with C, another board is going to be addressing this down the road. So, like, so what I meant by that is. Option A is the better investment. So yeah, we taxpayers right? and and truthfully, as we as we attacked option C, we hoped to come up with an option C that might come in about ninety million. I mean, yeah, where it was this yeah, it huge happen. difference and and still address everything. Unfortunately, that it's just not where the numbers are. So well, and I, I think, think that, Mr. Emmon, did Desi, did you have a question a while ago? I, don't, I thought I, I was just asking a while ago. I was going to ask how much was the capacity at Grand Oaks and what did Grand Oaks cost. So well, Grand Oaks, we designed Grand Oaks for a program of 3,000 students, and the all-in figure was right at 160 million. Once we got it outfitted to teach and open the door on the first day, that would that would include all the design fees, furniture, curriculum, instruction materials, all those things. So I think there's going to be a challenge in saying we're not in com uh, increasing capacity, and we're going to spend 150. And in a couple more years, we're going to do another high school for another hundred. But Mr. Emmett, everybody knows it's more expensive. I mean, yeah. you, you've built houses before. Is it more expensive per square foot to have to redo or build on a green lot? A green lot's cheaper. Absolutely. That's and the, the other... But, but if I got a $100,000 house, I don't build a $100,000 redo on it. But the, the difference on... You do after 100 years. And the, one of the differences with Conroe High School is it's a significantly larger building. And it houses CTE programs that Grand Oaks does not have. And they are... That those are the, that's the most expensive square feet that we have in the school district. Nope. So it, that's a little misleading to to make an argument that you know Conroe High School is going to have a capacity of four thousand. Grand Oaks is three thousand. It's it's renovation instead of empty lot. It has elevation challenges that have to be dealt with, and it has the CTE programs which are significantly more expensive. So while yes, they're both high schools. Uh, it is not an apples to apples comparison as to those two projects. They're significantly yeah. different. So so and Mr. Emma did make a good point. point. Yeah. His yeah. point was, why don't you just bulldoze and build another one? So what do you do with the kids? That's the issue. That's the issue. And that was the, build another one. That was the 2015. 
I thought the question was what I do with a hundred year old house. I understand. You said bulldoze. Well, no, no. So well, the house I bulldoze it, but now we're going to school. Yeah. Well, first of all, mixed metaphors. First of all, Mr. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm house. sorry, but, but first of all, a hundred years ago, that hundred thousand dollar house wasn't a hundred thousand. So you're building a hundred thousand dollar house, just renovating a hundred year old house. That's my point. Don't don't hold me to the numbers, okay? But second of all, your high school is a is a fourth larger, okay? It is much more difficult to, I mean, that, that high school has parts of it that are, have outused their usefulness. Mm -hmm. I've seen the x-rays of the pipes. Okay. And that's being done, whether we do the second part or not granted. Okay. But then, you know, what do you want to do? Connect the buildings. I mean, you know, you don't want to do the gyms. You want to do this, you want to do that. And it's, it, that's the problem. It's been piecemeal together and then connecting it all and bring it together to look like a cohesive unit. Is more expensive than if we'd have just, you know, got but, to design it. It's great. And to give that, let me let me and give you the historical. My question was just how much no. Grand Oaks cost, uh, Grand Oaks cost yeah. and how many capacity. It's, valid. it's a valid question. And let me give you like the historical piece because you weren't you weren't here in 2015 because that we had that conversation of you know should we at that time just build the new high school on the site where Stockton is and just build that as being brand new Conroe High School and bulldoze this one and in the future we could rebuild a high school across the street um but you have a stadium to deal with over here also which is you know today to build a stadium is at least 40 million most of them are 60 million um so we couldn't sell that land um there's certainly we talk about nostalgia but the idea of vacating that site or bulldozing the entire building was hard to stomach additionally there's been some work done there there was investment in mm -hmm. And, you know, like we, we, we showed you like the science wing, the band hall, there was new, new building that was done there that didn't make financial sense to abandon. But that was a consideration. I mean, all, and we even looked with on that site itself. Was there a way to, you know, could we occupy that, that, um, that school on that site and basically rebuild a new high school somewhere else on the site, but the site's not big enough do to do that. Austin. Yeah. So we would have had to build the brand new high school, move them and then build and then rebuild this one. In the end, I don't know if that would have saved any money. It may have it may have saved money in the end, but I don't know. It just depends on when when you rebuild it. Um, what we know is probably by the time we build the new high school on that Stockton site, if you think it's I don't know, 8 years away or whatever it may be, and I'm sure by then high schools will be 200 million dollars. Yeah, it'll be insane. Um, I'm sure. So. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions? So I, we appreciate you all tonight. Uh, I'll certainly welcome any questions or feedback from you moving forward um, or any ideas that you may have as we continue to consider these things. And um, we'll be in touch about a potential July date because I think we might need it. So we'll let you know. All right. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you.